Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for January 18th, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. City manager Van Milligan? Here. City attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, and Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, thank you, Adrian. Tonight we actually have some special guests with us that are gonna lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm going to invite uh, Cub Scout Troop 100 and Boy Scout PAC 94 members to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. So come on up. And those of you who are able to stand, please join us. Whenever you're ready. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Adrian. <coughs> Next, under presentations, we have the COVID-19 update. I'm gonna share my screen here. As soon as I get the go ahead. Okay, so it's January 18th, 2022, embarking on our third year of a pandemic. Um, just a slight update to our Dubuque County Public Health Incident Management team um, with the retirement of Patrice Lambert, uh, County Health Director, on uh, December 31st. Samantha Cloft, who was previously the Assistant County Health Director, has assumed the role on an interim basis. So we welcome Samantha um, to the incident management team, although she was participating um, previously. So this is the total epi curve and um, it demonstrates that we are about as high as we were last November in 2021 and also demonstrates that we have not peaked yet with this latest surge in the number of COVID-19 cases. As a matter of fact, when we look at our seven day um, numbers here, um, we, we have a rather large surge going on, especially since um, January 5th. And um, tomorrow when we do the update, I expect that number to go up again. And we're at a 21.5% seven-day average positivity rate. 
and pretty much the whole country is at high transmission for COVID-19. When we look at the age groups of those being um, infected in the last seven days, um, we see that the 18 to 29 year old age group continues um, to lead that category. And that has been the way it's been for about the month of January. If for further breakdown, I'll tell you that zero to 10 year olds this past week had about 8% of the cases and just the 19 to 24 year old age group had about 13% of the cases. Um, we're seeing fewer cases in the elderly population. This is all primarily due to the Omicron variant, which began in November. Um, last month in December, we had just a few, a smaller percentage of the amount in Dubuque County, but right now of the um, cases, the positive cases that have been sequenced at the State Hygienic Lab in Dubuque County, 100% of them are Omicron. In the state, um, of the cases sequenced, there's about 77% Omicron. So it's safe to say that those, um, it's, it's the dominant variant. So our hospital um, capability and capacity continues to be monitored with the incident management team in our two hospitals. Um, the number you see on your screen of 35 inpatients on um, January 12th, this will also go up again tomorrow when we have our seven day update that the hospitals provide to us. Just a little bit more about hospitalizations and um, the CDC has compiled this data. I know there's a lot on this slide, but it's basically showing that by far the number of people hospitalized are those unvaccinated and have a much greater chance of becoming hospitalized. And you can see that the, the wide gap between those hospitalized, particularly in children, and also as of late in adults between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. So clearly, um, this is where we want to continue to focus our efforts is on vaccinations. So right now, um, we continue to incrementally increase the number of fully vaccinated People in Dubuque County, we're at about 62% right now. And um, of the children age five to 11, who've completed their two dose series, uh, 1,894 are vaccinated. And uh, this is the latest group to be added to those eligible to receive vaccines. Now, if we look closer at um, who's been received their booster dose, um, we can see that it decreases with decreasing age. Um, those 65 and older had 81% of those eligible for a vaccine um, booster dose have received theirs. And you can see um, the numbers down through the different age groups. We, we clearly, there is room for improvement here, but also keep in mind that people are only eligible for their booster um, five or six months after they were fully vaccinated. However, the majority of the population is eligible for that dose. So to kind of clarify fully vaccinated versus boosted, um, the CDC is kind of uh, updating their language and I, I fully agree with it in that, how to describe fully vaccinated versus boosted. We know that fully vaccinated includes the two dose series of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or the single dose of J&J &J vaccine. Boosted is now going to be referred to as up to date, meaning that you've received the additional dose of Pfizer, Moderna or J&J &J vaccine. And this is important because there are some differentiations, particularly on the quarantine period for up to date versus unvaccinated. We continue to promote vaccination clinics and, and keep our website updated with our doctor's offices, pharmacies, and retail outlets as to their availability. And our VNA continues to do walk-in clinics on Mondays and Fridays. And, and also they have availability of vaccine throughout the week as staff is available. So no one will be turned away if they're ready to get vaccinated. 
testing is currently very challenged in the community and quite frankly around the country. Um, healthcare providers are on limited allocation. Um, the one of two free test sites is temporarily closed. Retail store availability fluctuates and the stores are experiencing back orders of those rapid over-the-counter tests. The test Iowa take-home kits continue to be available, however. Um, and today, the federal uh, website to order free at-home test kits went live. And um, we, we need to remember that as the need for COVID testing remains high, and the supplies are limited, particularly the rapid testing supplies. The quarantine is still a necessary step while we're awaiting test results, especially if you're not up to date on your vaccinations. Um, rapid test kit supplies are being prioritized brought by healthcare providers for those who are ill or undergoing procedures. So we ask the community to um, use what they have in terms of test kits to not um, seek testing to uh, return to work or school after they've had positive COVID tests or to shorten quarantine or isolation periods. Um, the main message is to follow the CDC isolation and quarantine guidance. So um, to Tomorrow at the uh, Dubuque County Board of Health meeting, our incident management team will be recommending a new approach to contact tracing, um, primarily due to the increased numbers, Omicron, and a lot of other factors. Um, we will be not doing individual contacting of positive cases anymore. We will focus on quarantine and isolation public messaging and provide a hotline through the DNA for those needing isolation and quarantine information and questions and assistance. We'll be doing a mass media campaign over a variety of media methods to get the word out and provide updated quarantine and isolation information. And this, infer this uh, change, um, you know, has happened in numerous other counties throughout the state and um, does not affect um, a change in funding, but rather a reallocation of that contact tracing funding. So that will be pretty uh, discussed at the Board of Health meeting tomorrow night. And the latest update of uh, new guidance and recommendations re revolves around the CDC and their mask wearing. And this is kind of the simplified version of um, the masks that are uh, recommended to use, and those are the N95s and the KN95s are the most effective, followed by the disposable masks. And all of these masks, any one of them are better than not masking at all. Um, the, the most important thing is, you know, the thickness, the fit, that they fit very closely, that they have a nose piece, and that you can tolerate wearing them for however long you need to wear them, depending on where you are. So we continue to promote that, especially in lieu of our most recent surge. So that's what I have for you tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, Mary Rose. Uh, what questions do we have for Mary Rose tonight? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much for that report. Um, I noticed that in your in our local stats, it says that the elderly are um, they're not a high number of what uh, what we have it here in the county. But I, I read a popular press report that says that the elderly are most affected with serious illness and death. Is that is that true as well as well in Dubuque County? Uh Currently, I don't think they're disproportionately affected by hospitalizations, but they, um, that 65 and older group, especially 70 and older group, um, are, do have some hospitalizations, even though they are up to date on the vaccination. So they, um, as we age, we know our immune system is not as um, virulent as it was in younger years, and it does make the elderly more susceptible. So. Um, 
you're correct. Um, the numbers here in Dubuque County are man manageable and I, I can provide you those numbers if you like. I didn't include that slide of those that are hospitalized. You know, you hear so much in the, uh, in the press and in the public. Um, is there a, a reasonable analogy to compare Omicron to other, uh, other viruses that we're more familiar with, like the flu? Is it twice as tough or is it you just can't compare these things? Because I hear a lot of different people try to compare them, and I would like to hear anything that you might add. Yeah, um, regarding, you know, just how communicable is um, COVID-19, you know, compared to things like measles and tuberculosis and influenza. And um, in some respects, COVID-19 COVID is, is more contagious than most influenzas. It's definitely not as contagious as measles or whooping cough or the mumps. Um, and, um, and, and that's based on mortality rates and, and some of the reproduction numbers there are. However, I think why we're seeing what we're seeing is because it again is a novel virus, a new virus, which no one has immunity to. And so um, that's why we're seeing the numbers. But the good news is, is that it's not as contagious as some of our other communicable diseases. Thank you for that helpful answer. All right, anybody else? Mary Rose, I have, I have a couple of questions here. Um, I, I'm getting the impression from people, and um, I could be wrong about my impression too, but I'm kind of getting the impression that, you know, this we hear that uh, this new variant, Omicron, is not as bad. So, you know, why do we really need to be all that concerned about it? So I, I think, you know, in some ways we see people really trying hard to get back to normal, which obviously we all want to do, um, not putting masks on, all these different things. You know, what, do you have any, I guess, any guidance for us on that particular line of reasoning? Well, there's a couple things to consider, Mayor Kavanaugh, about that those statements. And anecdotally, I, I think we can say that overall Omicron probably is less severe. However, with the numbers we're seeing, it still can make capacity and capability at our hospitals and healthcare um, providers um, crunched because there's simply greater numbers. So even a lower, uh, you know, less illness in greater numbers is going to produce some cases that are more severe and require hospitalization, et cetera. So the other thing to think about is everybody's immune systems are unique, how we react to vaccines, how we react to previous infections, and how you know robust we make antibodies and, and are able to fight off these infections. So um, there's no guarantee that if you haven't been infected, prior that this infection with Omicron will be uh, mild. There's absolutely no guarantee. Um, you can look at the statistics and see that, yeah, the chances are that are gonna be mild, but you have no guarantee with, with yourself. And the other thing to think about is there's a lot of other respiratory viruses circulating in the community, influenza, RSV, a number of things. There's nothing that says you can't get ill with those at the same time or concurrently. And um, that can really create a stress on people, especially this time of year when those viruses are all circulating pretty, pretty readily in the community. So um, again, no guarantees. Um, and the other thing um, that the data and research hasn't revealed yet is, you know, previous immunity through either natural, for, through natural infection, how long are you protected against Omicron? You know, we typically thought that we had immunity from natural disease and natural infection for about at least three months, but, you know, we don't know that for sure with this variant. And so that still needs to be um, researched and, and demonstrated um, for this particular variant. Okay, thank you. One more question to do with that. Uh, you know, you, I know the hospital numbers are, you know, hospitalizations are rising, which I think we expected because of the fact that we see that all across the country. 
um, following a surge, and you've told us multiple times before that that's the, the main thing we really need to be concerned about, hospitalizations and then obviously um, death following that. Uh, hospital numbers are up, but how are they doing? I mean, uh, you know, in your conversations with them, we know that there's staffing shortages at, at all hospitals, but you know, locally, our, our two main hospitals here, are they, are they handling this surge as it stands right now? Yes, um, I, I think it's, it's, they are handling the current surge. Their biggest challenge is staffing. Um, both hospitals have the highest number of staff out than they've had um, to date. So that is a constant challenge. They are taking advantage of decreased isolation and quarantine times for staff based on the new CDC guidance. They pretty much have to. Um, the other thing um, to consider here is that we know that hospitalizations and deaths are a lagging indicator. So we got our big jump last week to over 900 cases and um, expected to go up again tomorrow. So we'll start feeling the crunch on that number probably this week and next in terms of hospitalizations because we know that sometimes people don't end up in the hospital right after they're infected or test. So I think we continue to keep in touch with the hospitals. The state um, has extended the contract they have with um, providing temporary nurses and respiratory therapists to critical hospitals and our two Dubuque hospitals did receive staffing through that. So that's gonna continue through, um, I think the second week in February, which is good news for them because they have benefited from that added staffing. Okay, thank you. It's good to hear. Anybody, any follow-ups? Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Just, Jones. Just a quick comment. Uh, I plan to wear my mask in most places where people are around because I really enjoyed that I didn't get the flu last year, that none of my friends and neighbors and family got the flu last year. And I think that's because all of us were masked when we were around other people. So that's that's my plan for this year. And, and I hope I don't get COVID too. I'm up to date, but fingers still crossed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, th thank you, Mary Rose. Uh, you know, I'll just I'll I'll just say um, we are so sick of this. I, I mean, everybody's just so sick of it, and and I think that is something that we can say across the board for the entire world. We share that in common. Um, but with that said, we we really aren't done yet, and and unfortunately, we you know, Mary Rose, you started out saying we are in our third year of this, and and we're we're still there. We have to be concerned about the hospitals. We have to be concerned about our healthcare providers. That is our number one concern right now. Um, you know, I, I would ask us to be concerned about each other as well, but we really need to be concerned about our own healthcare infrastructure to make sure that we can treat what needs to be treated when it needs to be treated. The hospitals are doing a great job. They're gonna keep trying, and, and I know for a, a fact that they will do whatever they need to do to make, make it work for us as a community, but we have to help them out. So whatever you can do personally, um, we all ask you to please uh, take as many precautions as you can, hopefully only for a few more weeks, and then we can finally start to see some semblance of normalcy. But for right now, we are, we're still very much in this, so um, please take that to heart and, and do what you need to do. So thank you, Mary Rose. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Adrian. Next, under proclamations, we have Dubuque Eagles Eyes of the Future Month. All right. And I believe uh, Mr. Michael Deere is in the, in the house tonight for us. Would you like to accept this, Michael? And uh, you're going to read the proclamation? I will read it. Yeah, do you have anything to say beforehand? Or? Well, um, it's, good, it's great to be here, and, and all this, it's good to see the uh, city council. And congratulations to you, Brad. Thank you. We're very, very proud of you. And uh, hi, Michael. And uh, uh, the eyes of the future, uh, we're looking forward to the future and taking care of uh, people that need our help. And uh, just like this Thursday night at Pizza Ranch, we'll be, we have a fundraiser. We're, we're paying for bunk beds for homeless children. And we've got five bunk beds paid already, and we want to get a couple more paid for. We're homeless. That's down to almost home. They've converted over to homeless men with their homeless children. So we're, we're uh, providing all the bunk beds for the homeless children. So but anyway. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for all the work you do. We're going to hear about some, some of the great work right here in this proclamation, but I really appreciate you being here tonight to accept this. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. City of Dubuque Proclamation. 
Whereas in January 2008, founder and chairman Michael Deere sat down with Laura's student Matt Maloney, then president of the Laura student body, in a conference room at the student life office in, on the Laura's College campus to lay out a vision for college and high school students who have a passion for service to join a journey to empower people, make a profound investment in people, to be a resourceful partner with citizenship, and to follow their passion to heed a call to service to assist young students to further their education, pursue their dreams, and help those less fortunate. And whereas the Dubuque Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee members include students from Loris College, Clark University, University of Dubuque, Wallert Catholic High School, Senior High School, Hempstead High School, and NICC. And whereas Michael Deere is founder and chairman of the Eagles Eyes of the Future Committee, now in its 14th year, the Eyes on the Future Committee will hit a milestone next summer of raising a quarter of a million in its first 14 years of existence. And whereas, since January two, 2008, the Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee funds for six $500 college scholarships each year, which totaled $54,000 and includes $100 and a plaque donated each year to the high school and college teacher of the year. $100 each donated to Loris, Clark, and University of Dubuque Student and Education Fund, support and assist five homeless shelters with over $40,000 donated, monetary donations to Reflections in the Park, Toys for Tots, DARE programs with the Police and Sheriff's Department, Crescent Community Health Center, Operation New View, Dream Center, uh, Sign On for Literacy, Heating Assistance for Low Income Families, Multicultural Center, Two by Two Character Development, Prevention of Child Abuse, Mentor Dubuque, Dubuque Boys and Girls Clubs, Hillcrest Family Services, Vets Operation We Care, the VNA's Breast Cancer Screenings and Mammograms for Women with No Insurance, Salvation Army, Dubuque Humane Society, along with treats for the shelter animals, Open Closet, as well as services, Area Labor Harvest Food Pantry, as well as services, Christmas presents to 10 kids from Hillcrest Family Services who have no place to go for Christmas, Thanksgiving meals to 11 needy families, put on meals for our veterans at the Veterans Freedom Center, participated in their own Passion for Service Days as well as Christmas Service Week Day, and donating money for high school scholarships for five girls in Malawi, plus much more. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, do hereby officially recognize the extraordinary and continued efforts of the Dubuque Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee for their volunteer work and engaged citizenship, and hereby proclaim, proclaim the month of January 2022 in their honor in the City of Dubuque. If you want them, Michael. We can go ahead and give them a hand, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Mike, before you leave the room, uh, in case you didn't know, the Cub Scouts who are here are sponsored by the Eagles area as well. Um, so the Ice of the Future reaches beyond just the Ice of the, to the Future group. So yeah. thank Thanks you, Mr. Again, Jones, for, for throwing that in. I appreciate that. All right, Adrian. All right, we will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items Please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration and consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Is there anyone in the council chambers who would like anything removed from the consent agenda? All right, seeing no one, is there anyone virtually? There is not, and we've unmuted our phone participants as okay. well. Thank you. And Mayor Kavanaugh, I'd just like to state for the record, um, we did have someone uh, contact about the consent agenda. Katie Scoop of 1590 Earl Drive uh, did provide input to all city council regarding consent item number 16. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Barber. Yes, um, I would like to, um, item number 16 removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Okay, item Thank number 16. Frank. 
Um, that, that's, um, we don't need a motion for that one right now, but thank you, Mr. Sprint. Um, okay, so item 16, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Johnson. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the items in the consent agenda with the exception of number 16 and uh, approve as recommended. Second by Roussel. All right, we have a motion by Jones, second by Roussel um, to remove, to approve uh, with 16 removed. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, Ms. Farber, number 16. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item number 16 uh, is about the Falk Park resident letters and the petition. And I would like to per personally thank there's 42 residents of Earl Drive, Ideal Lane, and Ruin Street, and organizers Mark Gilligan, Donald Beadle, Mike Reed, Brad Davis, and Katie Shoup. Everyone, for taking the time to sign and send this petition to us requesting security cameras and lighting to be situated in Falk Park. I have visited this area a few times and agree with this request for added safety within the neighborhood and the apparent need to deter vandalism and other public nuances. I also wish to thank Mike Van Milligan, Jeremy Jensen and the police team, along with Alexis Steger and her housing inspector, inspectors for their professional assistance with the ongoing issues surrounding the Butterfield Apartments and Falk Park. Most importantly, I look forward to hearing from Mike and the staff about our next steps to help these residents feel more safe and secure within their neighborhood. Hopefully adequate funds will be appropriated and we can successfully restore comfort and safety and these residents and their families, uh, especially for their small children. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. I was going to pull that item as well. Um, I appreciate the, the communication. I appreciate the pictures. And I understand the, the problem. Um, and, uh, and I'm all for us diving in and finding a solution. So what I wanted to point out is that nothing's, nothing much will happen tonight except this will get received and filed and turned over to the city staff who will develop a response that will come back to this table and uh, perhaps a budget proposal, perhaps there are existing dollars that can be used to advance this, but it's, it's certainly not being ignored. Um, I think you've got a real deal, and I think you've done an outstanding job of telling the story to the city council. I very much appreciate that. So, uh, But the process starts tonight. Um, I can't imagine that this won't pass to receive and file and refer to staff, and I can't imagine that the staff will let us or you down. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. John. Anyone else? All right, then I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like yeah. to um, make a motion to receive and file and refer to the city manager. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Farber, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, <coughs> and we have four. First is resolution setting a public hearing on a proposed development agreement between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and Clower Manufacturing Company for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement for February 7th, 2022. Second is set for public hearing amending precinct 15 boundary description for February 7th, 2022. Third is resolution of necessity for the proposed amended and restated urban renewal plan for the Greater Downtown Urban Renewal District version 2022.1 for February 21st, 2022. And fourth is resolution of necessity for the proposed amended and restated urban renewal plan for the Greater Downtown Urban Renewal District version 2022.2 for February 21st, 2022. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearing for the dates and times specified. Second by Sprank. All right, we have a motion by Resnick, second by Sprank. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of mo uh, items on there. Any discussion before we move? Okay. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. We will move on to boards and commissions, and we have boards and commissions applicant review for the Historic Preservation Commission and appointments for the Equity and Human Rights Commission and the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission. 
All right. So first we have the Boards and Commission Applicant Review for the Historic Preservation Commission. We have uh, two openings, one three-year term through July 1st, 2023 uh, for the Langworthy uh, District, and then one three-year term through, the, through July 1st, 2024, uh, which is an at-large seat. We have two applicants, Melissa Castle and Thea Dement. Do we have anyone in the chambers to address this? Yes, please. Come on up to the podium and put the mic where you need it. Hello, oh. uh, my name's Taya Dement and I'm applying for the Langworthy uh, position for the Historic Preservation Commission. And um, the reason I'm doing that is because um, I wanna represent our neighborhood and I also wanna learn more about the process of um, historic preservation in our city. Um, we actually just moved there. We bought the Resnick's house, so it's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Uh, we made a lot of great friends already, and it's just kind of seemed, you know, we got a, the email from our neighborhood watch or whatever it is, and they said, we're looking for somebody, and I said, oh, that might be interesting, so that's why I'm applying. All right, well, thank you very much for your application. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Dunn? All right, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Anyone else to address the council on these applications? Anyone virtually? Okay. No emails received. All right. And moving on to the uh, Boards of Commission applicant appointment. So the first one we have is Equity and Human Rights Commission. And I wanted to make sure that, um, and I'm kind of doing this for myself too, for clarity, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we have a number of applicants, but this, um, this particular commission is subject to the state of Iowa gender balance law. So we can tonight elect up to two female applicants um, for appointments, or appoint two female female applicants for the open positions um, to keep this gender balance. So I just wanted to make that clear for everybody. Um, we have two different terms. The first is a one is one three-year term through January 1st, 2023. And I thought we would take that one first. And I, I would ask Adrian to please call the roll and then we can each um, name someone we would like to name to this particular position. Mr. Mayor, a, uh, yes, a Mr. clarification, Mayor. I yeah. understand the gender balance. Is that a guideline? Or are we making that a hard fast? I, I was going to ask the city attorney if this is a hard fast number we're looking at or a suggested number. So the way, the, <coughs> sorry, can you hear me? So the way the code reads is that you have to put it out for advertisement for a certain period of time and you have to make a good faith effort to recruit applicants across the board of all genders. And then what you do is uh, you leave it sit open for a certain period of time for that to happen. And if no one of uh, other genders puts in for it, at that point, after you've reached the time frame, you can appoint and create an imbalance. Um, if you have applicants across the board and you can get more towards gender balance, that is um, the preference in the state code as this is a state code created um, commission. So um, it, I would look at it more as a, um, a requirement than a guideline, but the enforcement mechanism is you know, less than clear. So you say it's more of a shall than a should? Correct. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions before we? Mr. Mayor, just yeah, a quick, Mr. Johnson. quick comment. Uh, we've, we've got a situation where we've got four positions we're going to fill, and we've got five outstanding applicants. And I just want to say that because one of those outstanding applicants isn't going to get appointed to anything tonight. And I hope that that person will stay in the pool um, because these commissions turn over and, and there's, there's a lot going on, and we need the talent. We've got a lot of gigs that uh, are unfilled in our commissions and boards. Um, we need you. So don't go away disappointed. Um, just wasn't your night if you don't get the, the appointment tonight. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out, Mr. Jones. There, there are, are many openings. Um, there'll be other openings coming up on the commission that, that, you, that you may want, but I think that's a really important point that you make. So um, thank you. Any other comments? All right, so then Adrian, if we could, uh, we'll call the roll for just the, we're just doing the, the one three-year term through January 1st, 2023 right now. Farber. Kurzak. Sprank. Jake Kurzak. Resnick. Jake Kurzak. Jones. Jake Kurzak. Roussel. Jake Kurzak. 
Kavanaugh. Jay Kerjack. So Jay Kerjack is appointed uh, to a three-year term through January 1st, 2023. So the next three-year term, this one's gonna get a little bit trickier, but um, just stick with me on this. Um, we are going to go ahead and just uh, do the same thing we just did, and we'll go through and do the roll. You choose the three applicants that you want for these positions, and then in the end, we will uh, see who gets the, the most votes out of everyone chosen, so. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I just wanna echo Rick's uh, comments about um, how lucky we are to have people that want to apply to work uh, and to commit themselves to support these commissions and help us with the governance of the city. So um, good candidates and unfortunately only three can can be appointed this time, but there's other opportunities. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Farber. All right, Adrian, go ahead. Farber, uh, Carla Anderson, Danita Grant, Maita Jolie, Sprank. Uh, Digita, Digita Grant, Maita Jolett, and Derricka Williams. Resnick. Carla Anderson, Danita Grant, Derricka Williams. Jones. Danita Grant, Maita Jolet, and Derricka Williams. Roussel. Carla Anderson, Maita Jolet, and Derricka Williams. Kavanaugh. Uh, Carla Anderson, Maida Gillette, and Derricka Williams. All right, by my count, I have five votes for Derricka Williams, five votes for Maida Gillette, four votes for Danita Grant, and four votes for Carla Anderson. Correct. Correct, okay. So then we will need to go one more time, and if you could vote between, please, Carla Anderson or Danita Grant. Farber, Danita Grant. Sprank. Danita Grant. Resnick. Danita Grant. Jones. Danita Grant. Roussel. Mm, Carla Anderson. Kavanaugh. Carla Anderson. So I have four votes for Danita Grant, two votes for Carla Anderson. So Danita Grant is appointed um, to, with Maida Gillette and Derricka Williams for three year terms through January 1st, 2025. Okay, and then our final um, appointment here is for the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission. We have one three year term through July 1st, 2024 and one applicant. So I will entertain a motion on this one, please. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Would the town major be promoted to fill the remainder of the three year terms through July 1st, 2024 on the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission? Second by Farber. All right, we have a motion by Jones, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. So Tom Major is appointed to a three year term on the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission through July 1st, 2024. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. In public hearing number one is request to rezone 2571 John F. Kennedy Road. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Resnick. We have a motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Resnick. Um, Wally, do, you, do we have Wally on the line to provide any staff report on this? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me, Mayor Kavanaugh? Yes, yeah, sure can, Wally. Yeah, great. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members, Wally Wernemont, Planning Services Manager. Um, so the request before you tonight is to rezone property located at 2571 John F. Kennedy Road from OR Office Residential to C3 General Commercial Zoning District with conditions. Um, the 
uh, city or the uh, zoning advisory commission held a public hearing with regards to this request. Um, we notified all property owners within 200 feet of the property to be rezoned. Um, at that public hearing, uh, Mr. Hughesman, who is the owner of a electrical business, um, is proposing to operate an electrical contractor shop out of that location. The, they came before the, the zoning advisory commission and they explained the proposed use of the property, you know, improvements to the property that are being that would include a driveway, um, a parking area at the rear of the property, and installing some screen fences um, associated with with the business. Uh, just a little bit of history about the property. Um, it's comprised of two parcels, and the northern parcel it contains an existing one-story uh, metal storage building. It's about 2,500 square feet in area, and that was constructed in 1965. And then the southern part of the property, which includes um, two buildings, it, which is a one-story 640 square foot wood frame commercial building. And then there that was previously used as a beauty shop. And then there is an attached 2,400 square foot metal storage building that was constructed in 1959 um, for the property. So at that public hearing, um, staff you know reviewed the staff report knowing the property location size existing development. We helped identify the existing zoning designations that are surrounding the property. Um, we noted the uh, general operations of the post electrical contractor shop. We discussed uh, that with those improvements that he mentioned with the driveway, um, some paving areas, uh, that requires a site plan. And as part of the site plan review process that goes before our uh, building, which is our construction inspections division, uh, fire, water, engineering, and our office planning to ensure it meets code requirements. Um, in addition to those reviews, uh, we get involved with screening of a commercial property that's directly adjacent to a residential property. Um, at that public hearing, there was a neighbor pro neighboring property owner who got up and spoke. Um, they were located directly behind the property. They had concerns with existing stormwater issues that are flowing onto their property from the subject property and some of the surrounding properties. Um, at that meeting, the commission discussed um, that by rezoning this, it also provides an opportunity um, for a site plan review process where uh, those stormwater issues can be addressed. We are well aware of the stormwater issues um, as we go through a site plan review process. If this property is to be rezoned, um, we would look at uh, helping to try and mitigate those stormwater issues that are impacting the adjoining property. At that public hearing, um, we looked at uh, the rezoning of the property from C3, and a C3 zoning district has several uh, permitted uses, primarily you know up to 37. And the, the commission discussed that they should look at making this conditional rezoning. We have other conditional rezonings along JFK and the, in the proximity of this property in order to help mitigate certain types of uh, uses that may have a negative impact on the surrounding property. So. Um, you know, they're looking at going from an office commercial district, which has 19 permitted uses, a C3 zoning district has 37, but that uh, zoning advisory commission uh, reduced that down to 17 for this conditional rezoning. And the only differences between what's allowed in the current OR office commercial district versus what's being proposed here is a barber beauty shop. Now, I mentioned that the property was a barber beauty shop that was grandfathered. Anytime we have a new use that comes in, it supersedes the existing use of the property. So um, by rezoning to C3C, uh, Barber Beauty Shop will be actually a permitted use and no longer a non-conforming use of the location. Uh, building services, uh, which is litany of different types of uses, there are services that are provided to commercial and residential property owners. If you think of painting, janitorial services, certain things like that. Uh, furniture, upholstery, repair, a photography studio, printing or publishing, um, and then also residential uses above the first floor only uh, are those additional uses that are not allowed in an office residential, which would be different from this. As part of a conditional rezoning, uh, those conditions need to be assigned by the property owner, and the property owner has signed uh, the memorandum of agreement. It is attached to the ordinance before you um, and notarized. So um, if the city council proposes to approve the request, um, the uh, memorandum of agreement would be required to be recorded and it runs with the property. In addition to the limited number of uses that are included in that ordinance, there are some additional requirements in order to help 
uh, mitigate potential issues. Um, when you think of contractor shops and yards, um, a lot of times they have a lot of outdoor storage. Um, one of the conditions in that memorandum agreement is that outdoor storage of any goods, materials, merchandise, or trash or waste outside of what's required for a code compliant collection area shall be strictly prohibited. So they won't be allowed to store anything outside the building other than their screen required dumpster location. Um, we wanted to reiterate that there's a requirement for screening uh, at, plus the adjoining residential property. So there'll be a requirement for screening and that's already required for the site plan review process, but we wanted to make it look more uh, notable with the request. So when they voted on this request of the Zoning Advisory Commission, it was voted by a vote of four to one. Um, one of the commissioners felt that a C3 district is not a good fit for this property, this neighborhood, and they could not support the request. So by a vote of four to one, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends that the City Council approve the request with the conditions outlined in the attached signed memorandum of agreement. And, uh, Chairperson Matt Mulligan is present to answer any questions you may have of the Zoning Advisory Commission. Otherwise, that is all I, that's all I have unless you guys have any questions for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wally. Does anybody have any questions for Wally while we have him on the line here? It won't be the last time we see him tonight, but yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yourself. Uh, Wally, I have a question for you. Um, this is Laura. Um, if the zoning were not changed and the um, property owner was to do one of the other permitted uses under the existing um, zoning, would they th would they still be able to install this driveway that um, they're looking at? I know that was one of the concerns of the homeowner um, in the area that, you know, that uh, the stormwater issue, but um, I just wondered if, a, if that kind of a driveway would be able to be installed no matter what happened. Um, yes, correct. So there are several other uses that are allowed in the current existing OR office residential. So um, the property owner right now, by right, um, if they were to follow an existing permitted use at that location, or any previous owner of the property, could uh, expand their parking lot, provide a driveway. Um, we would follow our site plan requirements, which would allow them to cover up to 80% of the lot with structure or impervious area. So we would take that through a site plan review process and make sure that we're helping to mitigate any issues with stormwater runoff, um, any of the other requirements that are associated with that. So yeah, currently the previous uses, um, when it was a barber booty shop, could it expand the parking, they could have added the driveway at that time. So okay. does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, at first I, was, I wasn't sure that C3 was going to be what is appropriate, but after looking at all the, the um, uses that were stricken from the from the list um i can i can support that okay thank you ms Russell. anyone else for wally okay all right thank you wally um so before i open this up for public comment i'm just gonna i might say this a few times tonight i have a feeling that there's going to be a number of public comments on a couple of different issues tonight so just a quick reminder that um when you when you do come up to the podium say your name and address um so make sure that we can get that recorded but then also if you can try to keep your comments to five minutes please i'd really appreciate that so we can get through everybody um i will um, be timing up here so i'll let you know if you get near that five minutes and i'll try to do so politely but i am going to cut you off so i just want you to know that all right so um we are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of, of a request from Terry Huseman to rezone property located at 2571 John F. Kennedy Road from OR Office Residential to C3 General Commercial Zoning District with conditions to allow an electrical contractor shop and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone in the council chambers to address us on this? All right, seeing none, any virtual comments on this one? We do not on this item. Okay. And no emails received. All right. I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Look, looks to me like the, the neighbors will have a better neighborhood once this all happens. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any other comments before we take the... All right. Then uh, we have a motion by Mr. Jones to waive the three readings so, and a second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. That motion passes 6-0. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. We have a motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. 
Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Public hearing number two is request to rezone the northwest corner of the intersection of Southwest Arterial and Tamarack Drive. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that the proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage to two council meetings prior to the meeting, which is to be finally passed, be suspended. Second by Sprank. A motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. Um, Wally, I think it's back to you again, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen and give a presentation here. As soon as Randy gives me the power. There, can you guys see my screen? We sure can. Okay, so um, the request before you tonight is the uh, proposed rezoning of that former River City development property um, to help create the Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads, which is a plan unit development um, for industrial, uh, industrial uses. Let's see if I can just move on here. There we go. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about the location of the property to be rezoned, a little bit about the annexation history, our development review process as it relates to industrial park development and our site plan review process. We're also going to talk about a conceptual development plan that's required as part of the include attached ordinance that was in your packet of information. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about traffic study, property access, and then have an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. So the first thing, um, the location of the property. So the subject property is comprised of five parcels, totaling approximately 156 acres. Um, this property is located at the southwest arterial and north of Tamarack Business Park. Um, the property has rolling topography, the stormwater sheds to the north and south from the site, which eventually flows under the highway into the Granger Creek. Um, property is presently used for agricultural, primarily row crops. There is some uh, timber on the property. And the uh, Southwest uh, U.S. Highway 151-61 interchange is located immediately to the southeast of the property. And there is a high pressure uh, gas main that extends through a portion of the property. This property has been uh, purchased and acquired by the City of Dubuque. So um, the City of Dubuque is the present property owner of the property. So annexation wise, uh, this came before the city council at the November 1st, 2021 meeting. Um, the area that's shaded in green is the uh, former Weber property and the area shaded in blue was the adjoining right of way property that had to be annexed in order to make the connection to our current corporate limits, which is that dashed red outline that's shown there. Um, those documents were properly filed and they were submitted to the secretary of state and the Secretary of State has acknowledged the receipt of those and have concurred with the annexation. So this property is officially in the corporate limits of the city of Dubuque. Um, so we also had some additional information, uh, informational meetings with the neighbors. Um, this is something that we always encourage anyone who's looking at rezoning the property to have an opportunity to meet all those property owners within 200 feet of the rezoning. Those are the individuals that are gonna be receiving notices um, so in this case, uh, we sent out those notices um, within 200 feet to the property owners, but then the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation helped assist us by mailing additional letters to multiple property owners well beyond the 200 foot um, notification boundary. Those include several property owners that lived on Military Road and also uh, business owners and property owners of Tamarack Business Park. I tried to hold a public meeting on December 28th, uh, we did hold a public meeting on December 28th, it was virtually um, we tried to hold that in person. Um, unfortunately, that was the night of the windstorm, so we had to cancel that meeting. Um, it's a good thing we scheduled the virtual meeting because the, the next day, next meeting date was actually the snowstorm. So um, we held that public meeting, uh, informational meeting virtually. Um, several of the property owners uh, attended that meeting. Uh, they had concerns with regards to uh, proximity of the industrial park to residential property, uh, lighting, uh, stormwater concerns. Um, a lot of discussion with regards to access um, through the uh, Katy Cove property residential uh, street, which I'll show on the conceptual development plan um, to the site. Um, there are other property owners that are concerned about uh, the interchange of Southwest Arterial and Tamarack uh, Drive. 
So um, I want to talk a little about industrial park development in the city of Dubuque. Um, we currently have four industrial parks. Um, um, Kerper Boulevard is one of our older industrial parks that was filled in along the backwater slough of the Mississippi River, um, located on Kerper Boulevard. Um, but then we also have three of our uh, kind of a two newer industrial parks, I would say, relative to Kerper Boulevard. Um, Dubuque Industrial Center is located west of the Northwest Arterial to Radford Road. Uh, that area um, was our first industrial park on the west side. And then an expansion of that as you went further west from Radford Road over to Seifel Road was Dubuque Industrial Center West. And that's a um, picture that's kind of being presented here on the uh, PowerPoint. And then uh, within the past uh, four years, three, four years, uh, we created Dubuque Industrial Center South. That is an industrial center that's located uh, north of Highway 20 on Seifel Road. Um, a lot of people may consider the Dubuque Technology Park an industrial park. Um, that is an office park. Um, a lot of times that gets lumped into some of the industrial park development discussion. So I want to talk a little bit about our development review process, how does it relate to the subdivision review process, and then also all the way down to the individual site for site plan review process. So both of these processes actually go through the City of Dubuque's development review team, um, and that is once again comprised of the Construction Inspections Division, our Engineering Department, Fire Department, Planning Services Department, and Water Department. But those are those are the five main departments that make up the development review team, but we send it out to all city departments and even some of the local private utility companies attend. Uh, in this case, uh, Black Hills Energy attends some of those meetings. Um, when we reach out to those additional departments, um, these are services may attend if there's park development, um, if there's a restaurant or anything they involve the health department, they will attend. Uh, Public Works Department gets involved with some of the road maintenance just questions. Um, economic development may attend the meeting. So there's plenty of opportunities for city departments to attend that meeting. And it provides an opportunity where we sit down with the developer, the engineer of the site and discuss the site plan to make sure they're adhering to the code requirements of the unit by development code. And in this case, um, above and beyond with the plan unit development, um, in the plan unit development, list the bulk regulations, some additional requirements that are above and beyond what you normally would have with straight rezoning from an industrial development side of things. Uh, so that is the, the process that we look at from, from a, the development review team side of things. So when we get involved with subdivision, we're looking at the entire development, the 156 acres. We're looking at grading plans, stormwater for the entire site, how that's gonna be managed, how's access to the site gonna work. Um, we also look at um, uh, not so much the lighting at that point, that gets really more into the individual site and development, but then also the landscaping requirements, open space, uh, street trees, certain things that come into play when we look at the entire subdivision review process. But then we get down to the specific site. So when we get involved with a potential client or a, a developer or purchaser of a lot, there's an additional development review process where we get down to reviewing the location of the building, setbacks from the property line, landscaping requirements, um, several other things uh, that will be addressed on this screen. Um, so these are just a few of the things that uh, we look at. There are some additional requirements that are above and beyond some of these. These are primarily those things that we look at when it comes before those city code issues. So we make sure that they're looking at site lighting, for instance, uh, making sure they have uh, cut off luminaires so we don't have issues with uh, light casting um, directly or providing glaring that interferes with property owners adjacent and then also traffic. We look at stormwater management, it's always a big issue. How are we managing the stormwater on the site? Uh, site landscaping, screening requirements, garbage dumpsters. Um, there's quite a few other things that, that we look at through the entire site plan review process. So as part of that plan unit development ordinance, there's a requirement for a conceptual development plan. Um, this conceptual development plan was prepared by a local engineering uh, firm that was hired by the city of Dubuque. Uh, as you look at this, it's a proposed phasing of the development. Um, the area outlined in red is the first phase, the blue area is the second phase, and the purple area is the third phase. Um, that necessarily doesn't mean that it's gonna be developed um, just the first phase. It could be developed all at once through grading of the site. Uh, it could be just developed with the first phase. Um, it really depends 
Um, the city is going to be working with hiring an engineering consultant to help with the further detailed design plans for the development. Um, but for our conceptual development layout plan, this is what's being proposed. And I'm going to point out some um, areas that have been identified on this conceptual plan. So one of the big questions is property access. Um, as shown in the lower right hand side, there's a circle that's uh, primarily the main access into the development will come off the of Tamarack uh, Drive. Um, that will provide access into the development. But then also you see these two other um, with elongated ovals in the upper left-hand side. That roadway you can see on the upper right, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, I don't know if that traces on your screen at all or not. But uh, this area uh, to the north there is Eddy Cove. That is a residential designed uh, county road uh, that is privately owned. Um, when the city purchased the property, that upper oval to the north um, has a stub street that goes directly into the property that provides access to that development. As we work with the engineering consultant firm um, to lay out more detailed specs with regards to this development, um, access will be uh, evaluated on uh, whether or not uh, it's going to be required to come off of Katie Co. There may be a situation where we need to have a secondary emergency access. Um, where emergency uh, personnel, like for instance, fire trucks, police, or um, ambulance service may need to get to the site in the event that uh, Tamarack Drive is blocked off or main access into the development. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, as we work through this and work with the engineering form, more detailed specs will come out with regards to how that access will actually look. Um, one concern that's always been discussed um, if you're familiar with the area is uh, we do not want to create a de facto off ramp for the military road. The military road does not have access onto the southwest arterial. Um, so um, concerns and discussions as we go through that with our engineering consultant firm and how that access will flow to the site will have uh, greater detail with regards to that. And because of that, we're going to require a traffic study. So the city of the vehicle will be conducting a traffic study for the development. Um, that traffic study will be shared with the Iowa Department of Transportation because the intersection that's shown here, Tamarack Drive and the Southwest Arterial is actually under the control of the Iowa DOT. Um, so as we look through that uh, traffic study, which will be required of that engineering consultant firm that we select, um, those results will be worked with the Iowa DOT to look at any potential site improvements in order to make safety or access into the Tamarack Drive and on the Southwest Arterial. Uh, safer and then also um, there'll be further discussion on how big that traffic study needs to be will that go all the way over to elmwood drive which is the other interchange located on the south side of that drawing or that image that you see before you um, and then also maybe some discussions with regards to the Katy cove um, location so one of the things we always talk about when we get involved with rezonings and access is our compliance with our comprehensive plan and when we look at industrial development in our community, we look at attracting large employment centers uh, with access to infrastructure facilities. You know, we're looking at trying to make sure this development does not disproportionately impact our residential areas. So as we work with that engineering firm to create a little bit more detailed designs, uh, we will be interacting with the joint property owners to uh, have a little bit more public input um, with regards to the development. Um, the comprehensive plan also identifies uh, appropriate expansion of existing industrial parks as identified on the future land use map. Um, there is already an industrial park in the area, Tamarack Business Park, um, that was developed with stub streets. Um, it has been uh, being developed, and uh, this is uh, another industrial park that will be directly adjacent to that existing industrial park. We also are going to look at exploring additional industrial development opportunities near the Duke Regional Airport, particularly the U.S. Highway 61 corridor, which is part of. You know, we look at expanding within and adjacent to existing development, um, which is anticipated. So we look at these potential selected industrial locations along major roadways. So, um, the, like the U.S. 20, which where we have Cypol Industrial Park, um, the Duke Industrial South. We look at U.S. Highway 151 and the Southwest Arterial. And then we also look at encouraging mixed use developments to create a vibrant um, environment where those residents can live, work, and play within walking and biking distance of the home and opportunity sites for the community. So as you see, as some of these industrial parks get developed, um, a lot of them are more park-like. If you look at our Duke Industrial Center West, 
um, our Duke, Duke Industrial Center South. But there's been this big push to actually incorporate um, housing within walking distance where people can live, be able to uh, access where they, they work, um, whether it's walking or biking. Um, and so those will be the things that we'll be discussing as we work with that detailed um, <coughs> details of the site as we developed it with the engineering consultant firm that we choose to hire. Um, that's all I have, unless you have any additional questions that you may or may not have. But um, to get back to the Zoning Advisory Commission, um, they had uh, quite a discussion with regards to the development. Um, they discussed it, noting that, you know, the required <laughs> additional review of the development, being a planned use development, um, and then also um, looking at traffic study and everything would help address most of the concerns that are being brought up by the, the joint property owners. Um, one thing I do need to note is that we have received written opposition and in the Unified Development Code, if we receive uh, a written notification of property owners that own greater than 20% or more of that 200 foot donut around the property to be rezoned, um, in this case, we have re received a couple signatures that pushes that threshold to about 34%. So that requires that the city council, um, in order to approve the ordinance or this request, it requires a supermajority vote. So that's uh, six, of the, uh, six of the seven council members. In this case, you have a vacant seat currently. So in order for this ordinance to pass, all six city council members would have to vote in favor in order to approve the rezoning. Um, I know that um, so uh, Matt Mulligan is present to answer any questions you may have from the Zoning Advisory Commission, but by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends that the City Council approve this request. Uh, that's all I have unless you guys have any questions for me. All right, thank you, Wally. Does anybody have any questions for Wally or Mr. Mulligan? Yes, Mr. Ms. Farmer. Mayor, Wally, this is Susan. Um, we hi, received, Susan. hi, we received some correspondence today from Conlon Construction and I think they were part of that percentage that you just quoted in terms of that ownership. Um, but uh, in Tim's letter, he noted that there were certain grading issues uh, that he ha had shown or expressed concern about, some being over 40 feet. Um, and therefore, if you were looking from it at the potentially buildup from a distance that it would look like the size of the building that we're currently in, uh, in terms of height, I just was wondering if you had some comments for us. About um, so, for sure. Um, Wally, we're my planning services manager. So, um, we are in Dubuque and we have topography issues. So, a lot of our development that we have in our area is going to be cut and fill. Um, as you see in the southwest Arteria where it's located, as you drive along that corridor and you look to your left and to your right, you see a lot of hills and valleys. Mm -hmm. And in order to develop those sites, you need to cut and fill. So you're gonna be pushing some of the dirt over in order to get a larger building pad. Um, we also look at having appropriate grades for streets. Um, for industrial development, you have a larger area. So as we work with that uh, consultant firm to look at how the best way this could be graded, um, there will be large areas where fill will be placed and there'll be large areas where uh, cut is being removed from the site. Um, that is commonplace in Dubuque, especially since we have the topography that we have to deal with. Okay, and do you have any concerns about his concern about landscaping and streetscaping and just the ambiance uh, from afar? Did you read his letter, by the way? I'm sorry, I don't yes, know. Yes, I did. Okay, yep, thank nope, you. Yes, that was provided to me um, via email, and yes, I definitely read all the neighborhood opposition, and then the people are providing letters in support of the request. So. Um, Aesthetics is one thing um, with regards to development. The city of Dubuque is gonna own the property. Um, we're gonna control it. I think if you look at our, uh, our past industrial parks mm -hmm. and you look at the amenities that are associated with them, they almost turn into uh, got bike trails. We have some areas with wet ponds. Um, it's almost uh, an opportunity to be a park with industrial buildings located into it. Um, the location uh, is prominent uh, as you come into the intersection, there is a hillside. So there is an ability to look at uh, different areas as those paths are being placed. I do not have any concerns with the aesthetics of the development. We actually get involved with covenants, with the design of the buildings. Um, that's way above and beyond uh, from a private developer would have. So for instance, if this was to be developed by anyone other than the city of Dubuque, um, they could propose the PUD ordinance. Most of the time, they would let that go into a straight 
um, industrial zone where we would not have design review curve requirements over the actual aesthetics of the building. But knowing um, that we have those with our Dubuque Industrial Center South and Dubuque Industrial Center West, uh, our technology park, um, I don't have any concerns with the aesthetics of the site, especially uh, it is an entryway into our community. Um, it is at a gateway, and um, I'm pretty sure that we're going to look at making sure it's well represented for the great city of Dubuque. Thank you, because I think that was his point as well as the uh, the entryway into the key city. He was concerned that you would see nothing but tops of buildings or concrete. So thank you for that. Appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Russell. Thank you. Wally, this is Laura. I had a couple questions. Um, one item that was mentioned in that letter was um, buffer. And can you kind of review for us how um, it, the industrial area would be buffered from between the residential and the industrial area? Um, so that is uh, that's a great question, uh, Ms. Roussel. So as we get through the development and the design standards, first of all, um, as you look at conceptual development plan, I don't know, can you guys still see my screen or am I off? We can, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I, I'm going to go back to that conceptual development plan. If you can get that pulled up here quick. All right. Navigate to, okay, so you can see the development plan there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, for, first of all, knowing that the required setbacks from distance from the property line and just the sheer topography of the site, um, there is pretty substantial uh, elevation changes. Um, especially from the Katy Cove area as we drop down um, to some of the building pads in some areas, um, you know, it could be pretty substantial 60 feet or so. So just the topography in itself is a buffer from looking um, from the site down. Now we have requirements where we can put in additional uh, landscaping. In the past, we have had areas where we planted coniferous evergreen trees, um, along the berm area to help provide some additional screening of the site. Understand that the way this development's laid out, there's a lot of property owners that are up on the hill and they're gonna look over the entire development. So it's not, it's not possible to completely screen the area, but then understand those individuals that in properties are located throughout of all city of Duke. Once again, we're ridges and valleys in this area and quite a bit of our other areas have unimpeded views for quite a, quite a few miles. So. Um, we will have the requirement to screen from the residential area. Um, that would be the areas um, to the left of pad four and pad five. And then also uh, where Katie Cove uh, subdivision, it's Wurzburger Acres subdivision, but Katie Cove is the name of the street, uh, which is that area to the purple and to the blue. You know, we will have requirements for screening up to a certain height um, from that. So those will all be worked out as we develop um, more details with the plan. And I would like to note that this is a very conceptual development plan. So if there's any major modifications or changes to this plan, say access changes, um, or uh, there's significant changes in pad levels or locations, that all has to go through an amendment process, which would go back to the Zoning Advisory Commission and back to the City Council. So we would have two more public hearings that we would have to go through, um, and that would be, provide opportunities for uh, public input. Did that help answer your question? Laura? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Wally. And I, I had one other question. Um, did you say that Katie Cove could be used as just in one of those emergency uh, exits where it's only used by first responders? I didn't quite understand your comment. Yeah, sure. So that will be um, analyzed uh, as we work with more further details with the development of the site. Um, when we have uh, developments, we always have concerns that we have two, uh, two ways of in, uh, two means of ingress um, and egress from the site. So if you imagine Tamarack Business Park and we have one access that comes into the site, um, say that access gets blocked off. Say it's an event where we may have severe weather and, and in this case there's no trees there, but say a tree blocks it, there's a situation where there might be a car blocking it. Um, uh, broken down or something like that. We need to have the ability to have the secondary access into into an area. Now, those do not get used very often at all. Actually, they get used more by just plowing them and keeping them clear um, for emergency access purposes. But we need to make sure we have that ability in the event we have a situation because we want to make sure that we are meeting our obligations to help uh, provide safety to our citizens and our and our property owners that are located in the city of Dubuque in the event of a certain 
access that would block certain um, access points into the development. So that will be evaluated as we go through. This is the first time <laughs> where that I'm aware of that we actually have a county owned residential street um, that provides access, potential access into the into this development. So um, like I mentioned, um, we'd have to evaluate that. It's not ideal. If there's opportunities where we can take access somewhere else, that's something that we would look at as we go through the uh, detailed plans. Um, but we still need to keep that option available in the event that we need to take access to that, to that uh, area. Um, at, by purchasing the property, we do become a member of the Homeowners Association, and we do have uh, access rights to that stub street and the roadway into the property. So, Thank you. Any, any other questions for Wally? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Wernemont. Uh, from reading um, a lot of materials here and also, I want to talk about a couple of the things that the citizens mentioned. You talked about a traffic study, and uh, their concern is that they really want to upgrade that intersection. Do you think that would lead to this, perhaps, an upgrade? That um, as we I'm sorry, I hope I'm clear. The intersection is would be Southwest Arterial and East right. Tamarack Drive. Yeah, so you're talking. So basically what you see on the screen there before you write that image. So yeah, as we look at that traffic study and that analysis, um, there, uh, and they look at the number of vehicle trips, um, the size of the vehicles as they go through that intersection, um, whatever comes of that traffic study, saying there may be offsite improvements, uh, whether that's a roundabout, um, the initial design of the Southwest Arterial did include roundabouts at these locations, but for some reason, as they went through the final design process, those roundabouts were not included in the final development of the area. Um, if that traffic study comes through and say there, there's a need for a roundabout or um, a signalized intersection, um, those would have to be taken up with the Iowa Department of Transportation for those improvements. Thank you. I guess they're concerned because they already feel that that intersection is unsafe already and nothing is, it's not being improved. Uh, and so if there's a traffic study that says, uh, oh, it doesn't need to be improved, then again, something uh, might not, you know, it might not be improved. And so uh, I, I guess that's, that is a concern that already that intersection is considered by many of the people who actually live in the area to be unsafe. And so um, I understand their concern that, again, so, you know, if somebody in the state says, well, it it's, doesn't rise to the level that we need to spend $500,000. So I'm just hoping that, um, but you already mentioned, I had a question, is this the extent of citizen input tonight? And you mentioned a couple areas that there will be public input invited uh, in this process, which is great. Um, I guess their other concern is, when I'm reading this through, generally um, they don't want this to be a place where you want to live, change to some place that you don't want to live. And you're saying that all this planning and our, our history of doing good work on all these different issues that were brought up um, by this noted property developer I already mentioned tonight, uh, they will be addressed and the citizens will be allowed to have their input. And uh, I, I appreciate that very much. And after all this input, I, I hope there's some satisfaction that they can have that uh, the, all the work that they've been, they're talking about these issues, they're very important issues. And I'm going to uh, support this tonight, but there has to be public that there still has to be a lot of public, uh, citizen input, and we have to we have to move the the dime on some of these I issues that they've already brought up that need attention. So um, uh, I hope that uh, we can do everything we can to make that happen. So thank you for your answers on that, Mr. Wernermont. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. It seems that we've kind of wandered into debate without holding the public hearing. Yeah, I, I do want to get to public hearing because I, I do want to make sure we hear public comments, but I want to make sure, I mean, we have Wally now, so do we have any other questions for Wally? Yeah. Um, Mr. Spring? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this may not be so much a Wally question, but more of a Mike question for our city manager. My question is, is when, was it like five or six years ago, we expanded water all the way out to the airport. Did we connect these two, this, the Silver Oaks subdivision and the Tamarack? Are they connected to city water as well? 
not uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. I'm not sure about your Silver Oaks question, but uh, we do have uh, an agreement with Tamarack to provide them sewer and water service, so we're doing that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, let's, uh, let's make sure we, we get the public a chance to speak on this. So uh, we are in a public hearing to consider the council approval of a request from the city of Dubuque to rezone property located at the northwest corner of the intersection of Southwest Arterial and Tamarack Drive from AG Agricultural to PI Planned Industrial designated for the Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads and Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Is there anyone in the council chambers to address the council on this item? All right, I think we might have somebody virtually, Corey, right? That's correct. The first resident that would like to speak is Nick Thompson of 10156 Military Road. Okay, Mr. Thompson, if you're on the line, go ahead. I am. Can you see me? Uh, yes, we can. We can hear you and see you. Yes. Okay, great. I guess my first comment would be that I think the definition of a, a decision that's arbitrary, capricious, and unreasonable is when a council member says they're going to voice support for the uh, endeavor before the public's had a chance to speak. So I'd, I'd like the record to note that. Uh, I think if you look at this development from the perspective of the Southwest Arterial and you look back on that property, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. If you take a look over to the left side of the conceptual development plan and see the nice neighborhood that's back there, it seems really unreasonable to anyone that lives in that area that an industrial park would be put in their front or backyards, which is exactly what the city council is planning to do here with a lot of uh, open questions, unclear uh, ideas, not sure how you're gonna access it. I mean, if you've ever driven on Katy Cove, the notion that that would be an access point for this development is absurd. It is absurd. And it would destroy the value of the homes that are on that street. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> my comments here, I feel a little disorganized because uh, Greater Dubuque Development Corp had committed to providing notice of the uh, development here and the ongoings. But the last thing I had was from December 22nd, letting me know that there was a member a couple days after a, a meeting a couple days after Christmas, which I was out of town for and couldn't attend. I found out about this meeting about 45 minutes ago, and I've spoken with several other people in the neighborhood that just found out this was happening. And I think it's fair to say that we're all pretty outraged about it. Uh, a couple other comments, um, you know, looking at the comprehensive plan, I, I think that it states that it can't. Um, unreasonably impact residential areas, I, I think this does. I mean, just look at Katy Cove and the neighborhood there. I live on Military Road, this would be in my backyard. Uh, be a huge impact, not just on me, not an individual problem, but a problem for a large group of people. Uh, and I also don't know, uh, I, I know that the comprehensive plan has to be amended for a zoning change, so I'm not sure if that's properly been done. I guess I'm a little concerned myself as well. I am the treasurer for the Shag Park utility, and we provide the water for uh, a bunch of the residences in the Shag Park development, which you can see on the map, and for Military Road. And <clears throat> I'm concerned with having an industrial park of the impact of potentially the release of chemicals into the water that we drink, which we pull from an aquifer below the ground. Uh, another comment would be, I, I think uh, Mr. Wernemont was incorrect in saying Katy Cove is a public road. I believe that that's privately owned. I don't live on the road, but I, I do think that's private property. And I, I just don't see how this is possibly feasible to uh, to try to run traffic through there. Also a dangerous intersection, as I think Mr. Resnick uh, asked about, not, not a good place to have a lot of traffic. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, I get, I get also a bit concerned about the fact that there's a ton of rock back there. I built the playground for my kids in the backyard last summer and graded about a foot and came into just rock, solid rock. So uh, I can't see how this could be developed without the, the necessary blasting impacting and damaging the property of the neighboring home, homeowners. And I guess I would just ask for the members of the city council how you would feel if there was a proposed development in an industrial park uh, going into your yard, because that's what uh, is about to happen, it appears. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. We, we appreciate your time and taking the time to speak with us. Are there any other virtual comments? There is. Christy Wurtzberger of 9762 Katie Cove. All right. Ms. Wurtzberger, go ahead. We can't hear you yet if you're on the line. Can you tell if she's muted here, Corey? It doesn't look like she's muted on okay. her end. Now, do we have a Christy Wurzberger with us? 
Okay, let's let's take a minute. Maybe is there anyone else um, we that has a comment at this time? There are no other comments in the GoToMeeting chat. Okay. Um, I am going to unmute our phone participants. Okay. As well. Ms. Wurzberger, I'd like to give you another opportunity here if you're there. Okay, unfortunately, we're not hearing any comments, so I'll, uh, for the moment, will any comments from, from uh, City Clerk? Yeah, I'd just like to state for the record um, some comments received, um, and they've slightly been referenced um, through this discussion, but I just want to make sure they're noted for the record. Um, first is uh, the letter uh, sent by Tim Conlin, Vice Chair and CEO of Conlin Construction Co. And then second is a two petitions submitted by Jack McCullough of McCullough Creative Inc. Those um, petitions were initially submitted for the November 1st, 2021 public hearing approving the voluntary annexation to the city of Dubuque. Since the petitions um, specifically mentioned rezoning, uh, they were also included with this agenda item. Okay, all right. I do have another resident who would like to speak, Steve Peters of 9878 Katie Cove. All right, Mr. Peters, are you there with us? Yes, I am. Yeah, we can uh, hear I guess you. what I want, okay, <laughs> I just wanted to go in and just, um, you know, not a lot of people are talking and I thought Nick made a lot of great comments and I suppose put all of his, his, his points. Um, you know, we've, these are the same points we've talked to Wally, I've talked to Wally directly. Um, we've had numerous, um, meetings on this topic. So I guess I just wanted to make sure that the city council realizes there is a lot of concern um, in, the, in the neighborhoods, in the, in the residential neighborhoods around the industrial park. Um, you may not be hearing a lot of it, but there's been a lot of discussion. And, you know, again, I know, you know, a lot of it, there is some preliminary activity going on, but a lot of it is, you know, we'll take that into consideration and, and we'll discuss it further. Um, you know, it doesn't really give us a direction of one, what's going to happen, you know, like with access to Katie Cove, you know, that intersection at Katie Cove and military road is, is extremely dangerous. It's a bus stop. Um, we can park up there to get our mail and stuff like that. So I guess I just want to make sure that the city council realizes that there's a tremendous amount of concern, um, by all residents, even though maybe not a lot of them are speaking, but I, again, I think Nick has made a lot of great points that I've heard numerous people um, commented on those as well. So I just wanted to said, make sure that you realize that this is not a one or two people have a concern. There's a lot of concern. Okay, That's thank it. you, Mr. Peters. Oh, go ahead, you have more? Nope, I'm oh. done. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. We'd like to go back to Kritzi Wurzberger and try one more time. Okay, let's try one more time, Ms. Wurzberger. Okay, are you able to hear me? We sure are. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, we live at 9762 Katie Cove. Um, the property that my husband and I own has been in their fa family for 80 years. So um, while you guys are all excited about developing this, I can, you guys can probably imagine we're not too thrilled. Um, this was land, you know, we thought our kids would grow up on and then live on and continue on. Um, we didn't really want a industrial park in the backyard. So a couple points to this. Um, Back by the cul-de-sac by where we live, you were proposing a 40 to 50 foot drop to an already existing 20 foot drop. This is right by our driveway, right before our driveway. How are you going to make this safe if someone, someone were to go off the road? Um, is that a question you're, you're expecting an answer for now, I Ms. Wurzberger? Yes, because I guess what we're frustrated with is there's no answers, you know, you guys aren't answering any of our questions. Everything's kind of like up in limbo and there's no direct answers to anything. Okay. Um, yeah. what, so what, I, oh, what I'll ask you to do is if you, if you have some more comments or questions, let's, um, I'll, I'll give you some time to say those now and then we can see if we can get your questions answered as we go further into the discussion here. Sure, because we I think we all would like some answers, um, some direct answers. Um, Katie Cove is a private road. I don't know whoever said that it was a county road, but Katie Cove is a private road. So you guys had that wrong. Um, the city is going to have access to it um, with this. So they will be responsible for taking care of it. Correct. For, um, I'll, I'll note that question. OK. Um, are there going to be any restrictions if there's third shift in these industrial buildings? Um, I really don't want to look at lights and noise and traffic 
you know, right now. I don't think anybody else does either. Um, another question. Um, we just actually, this is pretty frustrating. Nick touched on this, but we were not notified about this. My husband was at the last meeting, but nobody had notice of this in our whole subdivision. There was no letter out. There was nothing. Um, so I'm just curious why that was. Um, and my last comment would be, um, it's a comment, but it's a question. Um, if this was a private developer, would it be this easy? Would it be this easy to go through the process? It just kind of seems like, you know, we're little peons in this game and like, it's a done deal. You guys are kind of pacifying us with talking to us, but it doesn't matter what we say. You guys are just gonna, you know, do what you want in the long run. And that's frustrating. And that's the last thing I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wurzberger. I'm glad you were able to make it on to share that with us. We appreciate it. Any other comments? Uh, Jacob Boyd would like to speak, and I don't have an address, Jacob, if you can provide that. Go ahead, Jacob. Hey, can, uh, can I be heard here? Yes, you can. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to speak as well. Um, my frustration uh, echoing a couple of the, what feels like poor communication. We got the initial zoning request and then it seemed, uh, or zoning notification, and then it seemed like a lot of it kind of fell off the map. Um, the initial link that I got today to even join this uh, for the go-to meeting didn't appear to work, and uh, the whole spiel about the being available uh, on the agenda, um, I, if you actually look at your agenda, none of the links or phone numbers are on there. Um, so the one that's being provided and the one that's on the Dubuque website, um, at least that I could find uh, easily, so I, I'm a little bit surprised that some people were even able to join uh, because the, the preamble that was given uh, didn't appear to work. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, I, I really actually would like to even request that the Conlon construction letter be read because he brings up a lot of good points uh, that basically, you know, we're saying we're gonna address these things later, right? We, we have assurances that, you know, everything's gonna be good and that, <laughs> we're going to take the right steps, you know, based off of, uh, you know, previous uh, industrial parks. And, you know, some of those industrial parks that we do have, you know, they do have nice areas. They have green areas, they have, you know, walking paths, etc. cetera. Um, I don't see any of that kind of stuff in here that even gives an indication that there's going to bring any kind of benefit um, to, <laughs> to the residential area, other than just literally plopping something in our backyard. Um, uh, I will echo again, um, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of residents uh, that, that use the aquifer in the area. Um, unless the city is planning on, on going there, um, you know, the, the comment uh, by, by city planner was, well, we have a, an agreement with Tamarack, right, uh, to provide them water, and we're doing that, but that means that they have had that there, um, and they haven't had water provided yet is how I'm taking that. So like, I, I have concerns that whatever, you know, potential waste or, um, you know, if they're going to be using that aquifer or like, you know, whether there's been a study on, on what kind of impact uh, there's going to be to the potential surrounding communities where we get our water. I, I haven't seen any of that, right? We're, we're being asked to take all this on grace. And um, I, don't, I don't think that's appropriate. So... <laughs> I don't have a lot more to say other than, you know, I really appreciate Nick's eloquent, eloquent words. I appreciate uh, Conlon Construction's uh, letter, which I, I actually would like to have read. Um, but it, it, it seems, seems unreasonable um, what we're being asked to take on faith. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyd. We appreciate your comments. Did, did we get your address, by the way? Yep. Okay, you put that in the comments. Uh, or um, it's 10798 Shagbark Road. Thank you very much. Okay, any other public comments at this time? There are no additional requests to speak in the comments at this time. Okay. All right. Uh, I will bring it back to the table for discussion then, please. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. But I certainly get their, their concerns. And the process is not... Uh, process doesn't allow some of these questions to be answered. The process is to get to the next step so we can start to dig into them and answer them. Um, there's an action item later on to, to hire a consultant to start answering them, to start looking into what could be and what can't be. 
There are a number of protections in doing this as a planned industrial development as opposed to just fl uh, flat rezoning to, um, to industrial zoning. Um, and this is just, this is the next step. Now, if the city of Dubuque wasn't doing this, I guarantee you somebody would and somebody would be doing it pretty soon. And they wouldn't be doing it perhaps with those protections. Uh, first of all, we annexed it. Second of all, I, I appreciate the proximity to your backyards, but it's our backyard. The city of Dubuque owns that property now. Um, and we will do our level best to, to protect your yards, to protect your property, and to, to make it nice around the edges. Uh, one thing that, uh, that maybe talked about, maybe, maybe housing makes a buffer. Um, we, we need additional housing. Maybe people would choose to live on the edge of that property. I don't know. Um, but to get to, the, to get to the answers, we have to first ask the questions, and the questions will be asked by the consultant that, that starts to do a, an actual um, next level conceptual design. Yeah, there may be grading problems. That maybe they can't be overcome. Maybe they can. Um, there'll be uh, three-dimensional pictures to look at, and there'll be a lot more process. There will be another opportunity at this table because even if we if we get a good plan, if we, if we get the annex, if we get the uh, zoning change, that can happen tonight. But then we have to start figuring out now what? Maybe nobody wants to come and be the developer. Don't know that yet. Um, but whatever happens next has to come back here again and get approved the way it's gonna look, the way it's gonna actually be. The, the, the questions that were posed tonight will have to be answered. They'll have to be answered in sufficient detail to satisfy the, the city council and uh, hopefully to satisfy the neighborhood. So the thing to do is, because I'm absolutely certain this was gonna be an industrial development within the next few years, whether we do it or not, I think the thing to do is to uh, make this zoning change and get on to the next step. And we'll try our best to keep you engaged and, and informed as to what's going on and to, to listen to your concerns. And, and through this process, we should be able to ad adequately and, and uh, accurately answer most of your questions. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Yes, I, I uh, you know, it, it is tough to understand this process that we go through and it's a long process and it's supposed to be a, um, very in depth, in very, de God bless you, in very depth, uh, and it's really important to get citizen input. So, by my saying that I need, I think we need to go forward with this, we have gotten, first of all, an enormous amount of citizen input. And that's precisely why we need to go ahead with this. Because, as Mr. Jones talked about, in this step of the process, if we want those questions, to get answered, we need to get to that next step and find out what these answers are because it's just, it's preliminary. Right now it's scary and it's got to become, uh, I say, satisfactory to the citizens who are going to live there. Is it better than the bucolic existence that is out there? No. Now, I don't see how that is possible, but at least we should do, do no harm and do absolutely everything we can to make this palatable and maybe even a place where citizens say, I'm proud of this area, I wanna live there. So uh, precisely because we've gotten quite a bit of public input so far, and there's quite a bit of interest and people are passionate about this area, I am going to support this moving forward, getting the answers to these questions, that are some great questions and absolutely need to be answered to everybody's satisfaction. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Farmer. Could we extend the courtesy to um, Christy Wurzberger and perhaps have Wally, if he's still on the phone, answer her question? Well, um, I think I'm, I'm willing to entertain that idea, but the, I think what's important that we, that we consider as a part of this discussion is the step in the process where we are right now. We're talking about rezoning this property, and a lot of the questions that we are talking about here are things that do not apply to a rezoning and really can't be easily addressed without taking further steps and looking at what exactly is going to happen. For example, um, and I'm looking at some of the questions that I wrote down from Ms. Wurzberger about, um, you know, with the city's responsibility for the stub street that is there, um, the drop-off that she mentioned, those types of things. I think um, 
I, I'm I'm willing to to see what um, I, I do want to go back to Mr. Wernemont and see what kind of comments he has, and maybe um, Mike, as a city manager, you can also fill us in on a few things. But I, I think it's really important that we focus on what we're voting on here, which is a rezoning of this property. Well, I as thank well. you for those comments, and I, I understand that. Um, my point being is maybe we could have Wally have a sidebar conversation with Christy. Uh, to just satisfy those questions or to answer to the best of his capability uh, the possibility of um, how to answer those, if not now, in the mm -hmm. future, just as a courtesy. Sure. Thank so I'll, I'll take it for a moment. Um, Mike, I'll start with you as city manager. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make now regarding the, the item before us tonight, um, given the discussion that we've had so far? Thank you, uh, city manager Mike Van Milligan. I, I did want to finish my answer to, um, to Danny, because uh, he asked about Silver Oaks, and uh, engineering informed me that, yes, Silver Oaks will be connected to water. Um, the Most of the questions answered tonight at this stage in the process, there is no answer, but we definitely will stay in communications with the residents, and they're welcome to contact our engineering department or our planning department, and we'll do our best to keep them informed along the way, as I believe we have up till now. Um, and I do believe all the proper notices were sent. That really was a question that was relevant to tonight. So I would ask Wally, if you're still on, Wally, there was a question that somebody said they didn't receive a required notice. Yeah, so when we send notification out, we send notices of the public hearings and zoning advisory commission. Those are provided to all property owners within 200 feet. Um, and then at that meeting, we also make an announcement that this will be heard at the city council meeting on uh, this, this date with regards to that. And it's published as the agenda um, for the public. So um, that's the process that we've always followed with uh, sending notices to the, to, to the um, for rezonings. Now, understand that's only property owners within 200 feet, and that's where I had that discussion with regards to Grave View Development Corporation. Um, if we get involved with the city sending out notices or informing property greater than 200 feet away from the area to be rezoned, um, we get in situations where it's like, why were they notified? Why were we not notified? Um, so we have to stick to that strictly to that 200 foot uh, donut that's gonna go around the area to be rezoned. Um, so those are the individual property owners. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about this, um, especially when we got involved with uh, those public information meetings. Quite a few neighbors showed up with that, just the word of mouth, um, going out to the joint property owners in Wurzburger Acres on Katie Cove. Um, I do want to apologize. I did misspoken. Uh, maybe I did. But the uh, Katie Cove, it is a private county residential street. I have that noted in my staff report um, with regards to that for the development. Um, and as we look at traffic safety concerns um, along Katy Cove, uh, if there's concerns about drop off, um, those uh, are things that we look at when we look at development, whether or not there's a requirement for guardrail protection or uh, other things as we look at the, uh, the development as we go through that process. So. so in fact, we did do the proper notification yes. of people Correct. within 200 feet of the property. Okay. Um, the other thing I would point out is on the chat here, uh, one of the people who already spoke asked that they wanted a chance to speak again, and we notified him in the chat that the public hearing has been closed. Okay, thank you. And I, and I will stick with that. I think we'll keep the discussion here at the table with the council for the time being. Um, other discussion? Yeah, Ms. Roussel. Um, I have a question. I guess it'd be for Wally. Um, it sounds like some of the people felt that they um, didn't receive the, or didn't, um, get all the communication they needed, especially about tonight's meeting. And I you know sometimes, uh, you know, a one letter, maybe you didn't read it thoroughly or, or whatever. Uh, I'm wondering if there's going to be any additional public information meetings. It, it seems that um, the public does have good questions that we can build into the process to help us be as successful a neighbor as possible. Do you think there may be any additional um, kinds of communications or, or public information meetings going going forward? Um, uh, yes, mo um, planning services manager Wally Wormont. Yes, most definitely. Um, when we went through our consultant selection and we looked at it, we asked questions of the um, engineering, you know, the opportunities to interact with the surrounding property owners. 
Um, we want to have an open dialogue with the neighbors as this gets further developed in the details. Um, we are their neighbors. We are the adjoining property owners. We want to be good neighbors. We want to listen to um, issues and impacts. And as we get further into the design and specifications of it, there's opportunities to address and help mitigate some of those impacts from the development to the residential property. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so this has been a long discussion, which I think is very, very important and very good for this particular item. Um, it's the third discussion we've had at the table, at least, about um, in public hearing to be able to discuss this particular property. Um, we, I guess what I would say in, in my part, first of all, um, just to directly address a couple of the items that were, were asked by, um, by some of the, the folks who were making public comment. Um, questions are going to be answered at the appropriate time in the process. We want to make sure of that. That is something that's really important, that we are going to work very hard to make sure that those questions are answered. Um, and I, I do think we can work on the, the communication piece going forward as far as um, you know, the, the different types of, of public forum for these, for these different comments that we could be making. As far as reading a letter aloud that is already um, posted on the agenda, I'm not going to do that. Um, that, that is there for public. Um, for anybody to read. It's on the agenda. You can find that online. So that is definitely something. Um, all the, the public comments, public uh, input has been uploaded as of today. So in case you're looking for that, you can go there. Um, I think it's important to come back to the fact that this is what the item before us today is, is the vote on rezoning this particular property. Um, there is more discussion to be had. Uh, we've had quite a bit of it already. I think going forward, what, what I want to make sure we all try to focus on is how do we do this right? How do we do this in the best way possible? And that's what I'm hearing all of us say here at the table, so I appreciate that. So at this point, unless there's anything else that's um, very pressing from council, I would go ahead and call the, ask Adrian to call the roll. Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Sprank to waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. That motion passes 6-0. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. And we'll final consideration and pass into the ordinance. Second by Sprank. All right, motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Public hearing number three is amend the Unified Development Code to allow commercial greenhouse as a permitted use in C2, C2A, C3, C4, and CS zoning districts and to modify related parking requirements. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. We have a motion by Ms. Roussel, a second by Ms. Farber. Um, Wally, I think we're back to you one more time. Uh, yes, uh, once again, good evening, uh, Mayor Cavanaugh and City Council members. Um, the request before you is to amend the Unified Development Code to allow commercial greenhouses as a premier use in a C2, C2A, C3, C4, and commercial zoning districts and to modify those related parking um, requirements as it's associated with greenhouses for that. So, um, you know, the reason why we're looking at uh, this amendment is to allow additional opportunities to locate commercial greenhouses throughout our city. Um, in addition, you know, our comprehensive plan, uh, matches the 2037 encourages locally grown foods, you know, providing opportunities, expanded opportunities for limited commercial opportunities in neighborhoods, um, increasing the potential for adaptive use of buildings. Um, in addition, you know, when we look at the sex amendments, we take into consideration the impact in the entire city. Um, but there has also been a lot of recent discussions with current property owners that are looking at doing commercial greenhouse operations. And, you know, when we think of commercial greenhouses, we think of that glass structure, right, typically. Um, but the, as the technology has improved, um, there's a lot of opportunities to grow microgreens inside existing buildings. Um, not necessarily have to put up a glass structure. It could be in, inside an existing um, building that's already built. It could be a new building that's being constructed. Um, there's a lot of things with technology with regards to um, aquaponics. Actually, you know, there's opportunities to grow shrimp and fish inside of warehouse buildings now. So um, our unified development code needs to be flexible to address with the, the growing changes. 
And we see that, you know, expanded commercial greenhouses, which were only allowed in a C1 neighborhood commercial district, which is, you know, your uh, mom, pa corner um, areas throughout our residential areas. We thought we really needed to expand this to include all of our commercial districts. Um, that's everything except for the C5 district. Our C5 district is that area down on Main Street around the town clock area, but it is allowed throughout uh, our entire downtown area, our C3 and all our other commercial zones for that property. So um, with that amendment to the PUD, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing on the request. Um, they had a property owner or a potential um, person who's looking at opening a greenhouse. The owners of Reevolution Re Farmstead um, spoke at the public hearing and spoke in favor of the request. Um, the Zoning Advisory Commission um, took into consideration yeah, that impact of the comprehensive plan the opportunity to provide additional opportunities for growing and expanding a business throughout our community. Um, they had several discussions and, uh, you know, they voted um, to recommend approval of the text amendment um, by a vote of six to zero. And in order to approve this request, a simple majority vote is all it's needed at the city council for that. Uh, Zoning Advisory Commission Chairperson Matt Mulligan is available to answer any questions you may have to the commission. Um, but this was something that we felt needed to come from the city, um, especially when we we're trying to expand uh, greenhouses, but also really implement our comprehensive plan and also to help with those locally grown source foods in our community um, to help assist with, you know, buildings, um, excuse me, businesses, and then also our neighbors that may want to take advantage of that produce. Uh, we have some existing great commercial greenhouses already doing that. Why not expand it and have that opportunity for everyone in our community? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wally. All right. Any questions for Wally before we open it up to public comment? All right. We are in a public hearing to consider city council approval of a request from the city of Dubuque to amend the unified development code to allow commercial greenhouse as a permitted use in C2, C2A, C3, C4, and CS zoning districts and to modify related parking requirements. And zoning advisory commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone in the chambers to address us on this item? Just a quick reminder, name and address, please. Hello, my name is Corinne Shriver. I live at 2815 Jackson Street. Um, Wally actually mentioned that I had spoke at the um, zoning advisory um, meeting, but I thought I would share some of those thoughts with you all as well. Um, so I'm here in favor of the amendment. Um, we are currently running a property at 2418 Central, which is the former Pickle, Pickle Barrel building on Central. And we actually ran into this as a barrier as we are planning to use that building to expand our greenhouse um, type products. So microgreens, mushrooms, lettuce, spinach grown hydroponically. Um, and so that C2 zoning for that building was a limitation for us in continuing that project. So by allowing this amendment to pass, you would allow my husband and I as Reevolution Farms to create this indoor grow space, um, which would expand our current grow efforts along with creation of an indoor processing space for plants that we produce on an urban farm that we run um, on the former Holy Ghost ball field site. Um, this change in zoning would not only benefit us, but would allow others more flexibility to develop sustainable indoor grow operations within the city and support the city of Dubuque's mission of sustainability. By allowing the development of our grow space, the city of Dubuque will gain another small local business, which will be rehabbing a Central Avenue building, which in, is in desperate need of that rehabilitation. Um, and due to the nature of growing food, you automatically get a business where cleanliness and sanitation is a key component. So that building will be improved both cosmetically and structurally to allow for safe growing of produce. And hopefully our efforts will set precedents for others and inspire them to also look at buildings where they can create these indoor grow spaces or bring greenhouses into vacant lots within these zones. This amendment will also allow for the expansion of our educational efforts um, because we'll be able to grow indoor year round and connect with more local students. 
We're currently working um, with a summer agricultural program, but with having a year-round indoor growth space, we'll be able to expand that to um, classes offered every semester, um, starting with Holy Family students, but hopefully being able now with more space to expand out to Dubuque community schools and local colleges. So I would just encourage you to pass the amendment to benefit not only our business, our educational efforts, and the City of Dubuque sustainability mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fryer. We appreciate you coming to speak with us tonight. Any other public comments? Anything virtually? There is not on this item. Okay. And no emails received. All right. Back to the table then for discussion. Yes, Mr. Spring. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I cannot echo enough of what uh, Ms. Schreiber said. Um, it's a, I'm really in support of this. We're trying to revive the neighborhood, and I'm hopefully we can get this passed because this is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? All right. Well, I'd just like to say, um, you know, I, I think this is a great example of a, a partnership that needs to happen. Uh, and I, I appreciate Ms. Shriver coming in and sharing this with us. And then also I commend the, the city staff for, for seeing this as an opportunity for city regulations to get out of the way. I mean, we were, you know, our code was actually in the way of being able to do something um, and allow for some great innovation and also address a goal that we very clearly stated we had last year when we uh, were looking into food insecurity. So I think this is a really great opportunity and I'm, I'm looking forward to voting for it. Any other comments here? All right, so the uh, motion is to waive the three readings um, and uh, made by Ms. Roussel and seconded by Farber. Aiden, would you call the roll please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? That motion, uh, I, sorry, that motion passes 6-0. <laughs> so one ahead of myself there. Mr. Um, Mayor. Yes. I move the final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Farber. All right, motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Public hearing number four is sale of city-owned property at 1450 Iowa Street. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Roussel. Move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Um, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger requests the City Council approve the sale of city-owned real property located at 1450 Iowa Street to GT Development LLC for the purchase price of $1,000. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. All right, we are on a public hearing to consider city council approval of a sale of city owned real property located at 1450 Iowa Street to GT Development LLC for a purchase price of $1,000. City manager is recommending approval. Do we have anyone in the chambers to address us on this? Anyone virtually? Not on this item. No emails received. All right, back to the table for discussion. Okay, uh, we have motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. All right, do we have anyone in the Council Chambers to address us on anything? Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, and uh, most excellent staff, the City of Dubuque. My name is Rick Dickinson. I have the pleasure of serving as the President of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. I just wanted to briefly get up and uh, apologize to the concerned citizen in the last public hearing. 
that evidently uh, had not received the information he requested. Uh, I also like to apologize to the mayor, council, and the citizens for anyone else that did not receive that information. But I did want to inform you what we did do, and this reminds me of my father's adage that no good deed goes unpunished. Um, as Wally accurately uh, stated, the city has an obligation in a zoning hearing to notify citizens within 200 feet of the development. Uh, in collaboration with the city, uh, we felt that that wasn't sufficient notification, yet the city really can't go beyond that 200 because as Wally said, where do you stop? And so we cast a wide net uh, for those property owners on either side of Military Road, Tamarack uh, Industrial Park, and other neighbors uh, to a universe and decided to contact them personally. So just so you know, uh, on October 1st, we sent the first letter to 82 uh, residents in proximity to the Weber property. We followed up that letter, direct letter, to each of those households with a personal phone call from our office. We followed up on December 3rd with another letter to each of those households. Uh, we followed that up with another letter to each of those households on December 21st. And we also then called every resident we could during the windstorm when we uh, had to cancel, wisely cancel, uh, the prep uh, informational meeting that was uh, thankfully done by the city that wound up being a virtual meeting and have attended all those. So if anyone fell through the cracks, I do apologize for that, but I wanted the mayor, council, and the citizens to know the extra effort that was made because we think that communication is power, and I think uh, uh, a dialogue between the citizens and the city will lead to the best development possible. I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for your vote in the rezoning, and our office fully supports uh, the rezoning and the development of this property as the next industrial development for this community. I believe that the die was cast with the location of the Southwest Arterial for any accurate intersection on that arterial. And so those who wonder, each of the quadrants of each of those interchanges will be developed commercially because it makes great sense. And yes, it is change for all neighbors to that, and we acknowledge that. And if anybody's gonna do a good job of developing it, and I think the past is indication of the future, that is the city of Dubuque. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dickinson. Appreciate the comments. Good evening. I'm Mary Gronin. We live at 1766 Plymouth Court here in Dubuque. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you for your partnership and support. Uh, Dave Cliviter was actually going to speak here this evening, but unfortunately, um, he unexpectedly was not able to be here. Um, I, we just wanted to reach out, the, the letter that you all received on Sunday was the result of much input from a great cross-section of folks, including business, retail, hospitality, architects, nonprofits, and others, some of whom are here present this evening um, showing their support. <laughs> Excuse me. The many pages of thoughts collected throughout several meetings were boiled down to that which was provided to you. We believe that the best way to sum it up is as follows. Number one, this group would appreciate collaborating with city staff in crafting the RFP document that will be directed to potential candidates. We believe it's important to incorporate upfront as many specifics into the scope as possible. Number two, this group would appreciate being involved in the interview process. Number three, this group would appreciate being involved in the selection process. And number four, this group would appreciate being involved in the engagement process once the selected firm begins its work. We view this process as a collaboration between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. It is decidedly more work up front, but necessary work to achieve not just a good result, but an extraordinary result. There's a modest chance that the cost of this may exceed the target price that has been allocated. So we imagine the private sector may need to assist with funding. This is not out of the question. The whole initiative is bigger than the Millwork District master plan itself. What happens in the district will have ripple effects throughout the entire downtown, 
to include the 7th and 9th Street connectors to Main Street and Cable Car Square areas, including those of us with passion and drive for our community can only benefit Dubuque now and into the future. As Joe Hearn, president of Topaco Community Credit Union, so wisely put it, it's better to get it done right than to get it done fast. I thank you for your time. And thank Have you, Ms. Gronin, we appreciate that. Any other public input at this time? Uh, there is one, give me just a second. Okay, and actually I see Mr. Groney coming to the podium here, we'll have him go first, and then we can get back to that, thank you. Okay, I didn't mean to cut in front of someone. No, that's all so, right, go for it. Well, I just wanted to say briefly, uh, actually, I'm John Groney. Could you, I'm sorry, say your name and you, uh, John you were gonna Gronin, do that and I cut you off. I apologize, uh, John. Uh, John Groney, <laughs> Gronin, 1766 Plymouth Court. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that, as Mike Stickley said, this is an opportunity for us to get better. And I just, so when we talk about the RFP and we talk about participation, there's a large number of people that pr would productively like to be involved in that process. And many of them are here tonight. So we're talking about architects, merchants, restaurateurs, planners, artists, you know, movers and shakers in the community. So this is what we did in 2008, where a whole group of people came together from the public, private, nonprofit sector, Main Street, city staff, planning staff, management staff, uh, economic development, um, uh, community members from across the board packed the cabin out at Four Mounds in an evening. And the city staff, Cindy Steinhauser, Terry Goodman, Laura Carsons, Dave Cl uh, Heyer, were uh, manning the flip charts. And by the end of the night, after a bunch of beer and wine and a lot of passion, the whole cabin was covered, including picture windows above the mantel with flip charts. Everybody was engaged. Everybody was fired up. The city staff took that, distilled it down, brought it to the city manager. We all reviewed it, and we brought that forward to the council and said, this is our vision for the Millwork District. And that evening, the council literally applauded the public-private nonprofit partnership that came to the table. We wrote the RFP together, we interviewed the respondents together, we engaged with them together, and then 35 people, and I'm making up the number, I don't remember whether it was 40 or 25 people, most of the city council, many nonprofit leaders, people from the nonprofit sector, private sector, we all went to Minneapolis to work with the Cunningham Group for two or three days. We all stayed at the St. Paul Hotel. We broke bread together, we built community, and we dreamed about what we could do. It was powerful. And then when the Cunningham Group, along with Jeff Morton, came here to Dubuque, for a week, many of us cleared our slates. We didn't just show up like at the Grand River or the Julian Hotel to put some sticky notes on a board. We were engaged. We were there to do the hard work. And by the way, when the number came in too high and we said, this group from Minneapolis is full of piss and vinegar, let's choose them. Oh, by the way, they're more expensive. So the private sector met you halfway and put up some money. So it was really a powerful process and it produced an extraordinary result. Look at what we've done together, what the city has done, the money that's been raised, the private sector investment. We move mountains. So again, here we are. We wanna do a level set. Where, where have we come from? Where are we at? And what do we need to do? And so we're saying to you with just some of these people, that only some of the people are here in this room, wanna help us get it right with the RFP. And some of the people in this room, like the restaurant tours, there's a young man over there that's got visions with his friend about what we can do to check the workforce box to help bring their friends, their family back to Dubuque. They wanna be involved. They do not wanna be a passenger. They wanna be crew. And so we're on a mission to help ignite a public-private partnership perhaps like we haven't seen before. So here's our opportunity. There's people that need us to get it right. We can do 
great things again. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Gronin. My apologies for cutting you off as well. Thank you. <laughs> I have absolutely no comment on that. Any other public comment? Yes, uh, Corey, please. I do have a comment um, from an individual who would like me to read his comments into the record. So this comes from Dan Lobianco of 3503 West Way. Dan says, I concur with the comments expressed by Mary Gronin. We are in favor of a strong public-private partnership on every step of the update to the Millwork Master Plan, much like the real engagement we had with the original process. We like the idea of bringing our neighbors to the table on each step to establish the importance of this millwork plan renewal. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? That's the only comment in the chat. No emails received. No emails. Okay, thank you. All right, before we close uh, the public input section, then I just, I just real briefly wanna say, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate hearing from so many people tonight. Um, I know that we are not always going to agree with each other, um, and we've seen that already this evening, but I, I think it's incredibly important that we have this level of engagement in, in our city government, and um, I, I think we've seen more tonight than we've seen in a while. So hopefully, you know, as something that's been difficult through the pandemic to have to do this virtually so often, hopefully we're starting to see this come back. And I, I sincerely appreciate you all being here. I know a lot of you are sitting in the chambers and, and haven't spoken um, publicly, but you're here, and, and we really appreciate that. And I'm um, looking forward to some more discussion tonight. So we're about to enter the portion where it's just for the council to discuss. So Adrian, I'll turn it back to you, please. We'll move on to action items. And action item number one is Iowa Economic Development Authority Business Financial Assistance Application for Clower Manufacturing Company. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. All right, a motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors recommends City Council approval of a resolution authorizing the submission of a business financial assistance application by Clower Manufacturing Company to the Iowa Economic Development Authority for the proposed investment of approximately $14 million for the expansion of its operations in Dubuque. Clower Manufacturing Company, located in Dubuque, is a family-owned business that manufactures sheet metal building products for agricultural, commercial, and residential applications. Clower Manufacturing Company has been a Dubuque-based business since 1870 with a nationwide distribution network and a concentration in the Midwest. End markets include residential roofing accessories, residential siding, and soffit, as well as building components for agricultural and light commercial buildings. The need for additional space is required <clears throat> to satisfy company growth and existing product lines, which will be sold to new and existing customers. <clears throat> Subject to State of Iowa and the City of Dubuque approval, Clower Manufacturing Company is proposing to build a 73,000 square foot expansion to their existing facility on Roosevelt Street Extension in the greater downtown Dubuque uh, industrial area. The company would invest approximately $14 million in remodeling and machinery equipment. The company is proposing to create 16 new jobs with this expansion, all of which would qualify for the Iowa Economic Development Authority High Quality Jobs Incentive Program. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Okay, thank you, Mike. Before we move on, um, did we just lose our online feed or did we just lose our screens right here? Uh, just your screens here. Online is still connected. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so um, any discussion? All right, yeah, Ms. Roussel. I would like to just say thanks to this industry for their long history in Dubuque. Uh, pleased to hear their confidence in our community to invest in this expansion. And it's always a positive to hear about high quality jobs as well. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Well said. Okay, seeing no further discussion, then we have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Sprank. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Action item number two is Iowa Economic Development Authority Business Financial Assistance Application for Hormel Foods Corporation and Progressive Processing, LLC. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Yes, I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. 
Motion by Mr. Resnick, second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors recommends City Council approval of a resolution authorizing the submission of a business financial assistance application by Hormel Foods Corporation and Progressive Processing LLC to the Iowa Economic Development Authority for the proposed investment of approximately $43 million for the expansion of its operations in Dubuque. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Do you have any discussion? Well, before we vote, I just, oh, go ahead, Ms. Farmer. Yeah, Mr. Martin, I was just going to say on behalf of Hormel that, that it's just um, similar to what um, Mr. Sell said that um, aren't we fortunate that they have ex decided to expand here in Dubuque and that we um, basically have met their corporate standards for this expansion, uh, especially with their major product line, which is the spam yeah. product. So well, thank you very much, Hormel. Thank you. I was actually going to just say the same thing. I, I think, you know, for the, the dark days that we've seen throughout the pandemic, um, the days of worry that we all had as a community and thinking about how difficult it was going to be to come out of this, it's incredibly exciting to see companies expanding in this way um, and, and coming in, in multiples in the same meeting. So I think that this is something that is, uh, it is, it is very exciting and I'm looking forward to the, the future ahead. So we have a motion by Mr. Resnick and a second by Ms. Farber. Aiden, would you call the vote, please? Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Action item number three is Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads Consultant Selection for Design. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Jones. I will receive and file and approve. Second by Roussel. We have a motion by Mr. Jones, second by Ms. Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. On September 20th, 2021, the City Council approved the purchase of 156.25 acres of agricultural land from River City Development Group, LLC, at the intersections of Highway 15161 and Highway 52, or the Southwest Arterial. The property is near existing water and sanitary sewer infrastructure that was extended along the south side of Highway 61 to serve the airport. However, grading, paving, and utility infrastructure improvements are needed in order to fully serve the property as an industrial park. These improvement projects are being added to an ongoing list of needed infrastructure improvements throughout the city, some of which may be eligible for federal funding under the American Rescue Plan Act and or the Federal Infrastructure Bill. The city received five responses to requests for proposals for a design contract for the Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads Project at the U.S. Highway 151-6152 interchange. Following review of the proposals, two firms were selected for an interview. Based on the scores for both the written proposal and the interview, as well as a lower proposed fee, the committee recommends negotiating a contract with Origin Design. Economic Development Director Jill Connors recommends City Council authorization for the city manager to negotiate and execute a contract with Origin Design for design of the entire Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads project with an estimated cost of between $550,000 and $700,000. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. All right, thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I'd just like to point out to any of the folks that are still listening that were involved in the previous conversation, that, um, this design will be what it could be but it's not the end of the road here either. It'll have to come back and, and get approved. And there'll be some public input along the way. So um, this is in fact, just the next step to getting the answers and getting a, a viable design and then finding out what works for people and what doesn't, and how can it be tweaked? So um, of course I'll support this. Thank you, Mr. Jones. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, yeah, it, I really appreciate you pointing that out because this is another step, but it is a step of asking more questions. I mean, we, we definitely are trying to get as much information as we can here so we can do things right. So we have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Ms. Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Action item number four is request for proposal for historic millwork district master plan update. Mr. Mayor. 
Mr. Jones. Uh, I'll move to receive and file and approve to get this uh, discussion started. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Second. Development Director Jill Connors recommends City Council approval of a request for proposals for the historic Millwork District Master Plan update. The update of the historic Millwork District Master Plan will address, among other purposes, the transportation and parking needs and uses within the Millwork District. This is a requirement of the DePaco Development Agreement. The approved budget of $50,000 is in the fiscal year 2020 city budget. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. And even though it's not in my original memo, I would like to just uh, um, take some components out of the uh, RFP because um, I think it'll be illustrative of what the process is. Uh, once we select a consultant. And so these are the elements in the RFP being put out to potential consultants. And for instance, it says project scope. The historic millwork district master plan update will consist of multiple components, including equitable and inclusive engagement of various members of the community, diverse business leaders, government leaders, nonprofit leaders, and community members updating goals, identified development funding sources, and developing strategies to implement the updated plan, and identify ongoing public maintenance costs. So I think it's very important when you look at the project scope, it talks about the idea of having inclusive engagement, which I think was brought up earlier in some of the comments. And then <clears throat> later, when it goes on to describe community engagement and the request for proposals, here's what it says. Community engagement represents an important part of the project. As other planning efforts are underway in the downtown area in relation to smart parking and transportation and pedestrian experience, the consultant is expected to cooperate and coordinate with any other consultants engaged by the city that may be convening similar groups of stakeholders in order to avoid engagement fatigue of our business leaders and residents. The individually selected consultants will collectively be responsible for developing and implementing a robust, creative, and inclusive plan for community engagement. The process, much like the historic Millwork District Master Plan document, must be creative, interesting, meaningful, and relevant to residents and stakeholders. The community engagement plan should consider informing residents and stakeholders of the purposes of the plan, why it is important, and how the plan for the historic Millwork District intersects with other areas of the downtown and the community. The individual consultants will collectively develop a schedule of events and input opportunities, which at a minimum <clears throat> address the channels for public engagement and communication. The individual consultants will collectively be responsible for designing and facilitating the events and public input instruments, facilitating the events and collecting and distilling all information for use in the plan documents. The public engagement plan will need to take into consideration current public health guidelines due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's expected that a number of the events will need to be held virtually or in a hybrid format. Consultants should collectively, actively engage residents, members of the community, businesses, government, nonprofit, philanthropists, arts and culture pr practitioners and school leaders. The community input must be sought through different avenues in ways that are both comfortable and practical. The engagement process, process must be creative, inclusive, meaningful and relevant to the residents. At a minimum, community engagement shall include interesting activities, dialogue and creative opportunities to provide information independent of structured and facilitated events. Anticipate and take steps to remove or identify resources needed to remove potential barriers to engagement. Include community-based organizations that represent equity target populations. Involve participants in activities around the quantitative data, capturing their reactions to the data and the issues that are most important. So I hope that's a demonstration of exactly what was asked for is this is gonna be a robust community engagement process that's gonna try and create creative ways for everybody to get their voice heard about what they think should be in the update of the existing Millwork District Master Plan. 
Okay. Thank you, Mike. Discussion. Um, Mr. Starman. Mayor, yeah. so I've spent the majority of the last two days talking to most of the people that have appeared here tonight and others who could not make it, uh, which composed uh, the small business um, owners in the Millwork District, the merchants, and some of the major corporations. Um, and I specifically asked the same questions to everybody so that I could get an understanding of what the, the ask was as they were looking for uh, more engagement in this process. And all of them said it was important to be um, part of the updated creation of the RFP. They were looking for more, and these are their words, not mine, uh, more buy-in to provide more insightful comments. They all have vested interest uh, in this um, neighborhood, in this area to live and work. Um, and one in particular said that she brings in over 500 people into the Millwork District every day. Uh, for her health care, for her gym. Um, and she was very, very concerned not only about the parking, but just the whole opportunity to have more significant input into this process. Um, they feel that the change has occurred because of the pandemic and that the largest corporation being tobacco, which there's three of them that were represented, uh, basically were concerned that they would like this up-to-date input. Um, and they were concerned, and I think this is obvious, about the connectivity to the corridors that was just expressed uh, for 7th and 9th to Main Street into Cable Car Square, and to decrease the footprint of the cars uh, into the Millwork District. And so tobacco is really looking not necessarily to have a definition of more parking, but the appropriate kind of parking. And so they, again, applaud the efforts of all that has been done for the RFP, but they think it's just a little bit short of current adjusting needs. Um, so therefore, um, I'm more supportive of opening it up just a little bit longer uh, with Jill to better define, to involve some of these um, citizens that are so concerned about their area. They live there, they work there, they know it best, um, and they're looking for just ways to make it more smart, more effective, and more efficient for everybody living there, and then on the comprehensive plan to take it a step into the major corridors uh, with the Main Street and with Cable Car Square. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Farber. Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, Ms. Roussel, I think I saw your yeah. hand first. Um, I, I would support the, the comments that um, Ms. Farber has just said. Um, we have so many stakeholders who are willing to help us and invest in this plan. And I think it would be worthwhile to take time for a step back and have this robust stakeholder engagement before we submit the RFP. Uh, to have the best possible outcome. I think that public-private partnerships have always been Dubuque's secret sauce, and I think we should apply that idea here. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Mr. Resnick? Yes, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank city staff. The draft RFP was very well put together considering the amount of input, so thank you for reading those, um, those parts uh, uh, that you did, Mr. Van Milligan. Um, I, you know, the RFP is all about saying, what are we looking for? And if you don't ask the right questions, you're not gonna get the right answers. And I do think that the stakeholders do know the right questions. Many that were, uh, were talked about in uh, Mr. Van Milligan's memo. But I also do think, uh, as, as my fellow council members have talked about, that we pride ourselves, it's, it's a little messier sometimes, it takes a little longer, but it really gins up the excitement too and, and the participation when we invite uh, this, these kind of motivated stakeholders. Uh, not just, uh, they're not just motivated by their own uh, personal gain, but uh, just what, how we can make this city a better place. I'm excited by that. It's really done a, a, a lot. They've, uh, almost all of them have uh, done so much for the city already. They want to continue that. I, I appreciate that. So I also would like to find a way to include uh, this uh, Millwork District State, the Millwork District stakeholders in the RFP. And, um, and uh, it, it might be tough to get a process with so many people, but it's exciting and I think it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Other comments? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Sprank. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, to echo quite a bit of what, our, what my other fellow council folks have said, but I also feel it's not big enough. 
um, we really have to think after reading that whole packet that we were given, um, I had a long time, I took 10 hours of reading that whole packet regarding the Five Flags project. It's just, we need to think bigger. We need to think all of downtown. We need to think all the way from the millwork to the bluffs. And it's just, I think we need to look at it much on a bigger scale, at how all the pieces are tied together, how we want all the pieces to work together. So I just don't know how we can make that happen, where we can think beyond the millwork, where we need to tie in the downtown as well. So thank you. Mr. Jones. Well, there's, there's a great deal of merit in everything that's been said tonight. Um, here's the challenge. One of the reasons that we want to hire professional services to manage the dialogue as they create this new master plan for the city council's input and approval is that the staff is at capacity and has been over capacity for almost a decade now. And when this first RFP was put together, um, we had four city staff engaged in it uh, a lot. And we had a lot of meetings and a lot of, a lot of go to and, and we've learned a lot from all of that. And I, I, I'm not saying any of this to sell, sell short what you're bringing to us um, from the group. Um, I do think that we need representation of the shareholders at the, in the selection process to review this, the proposals that come back. I think that we need them in the, absolutely need them in the public engagement process, and that's going to have a lot of tentacles going a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, but as I read the RFP, it's really pretty good. And the biggest focus of it is to cause an extraordinary public engagement process. And that's what that's the biggest thing that you're looking for. And it's it's right here to have for you. Uh, I, I won't object to it. I won't. Uh, I don't want you to not have your hands all over this thing because uh, the proof is in the pudding. Look what's happened. My God, we have an extraordinary um, development where there was essentially uh, rundown buildings that uh, were getting more rundown by the day. Um, but the reality is I don't know if we can deliver what you want without adding staff to manage it. And that's the reason that we're looking for professional services to help guide this process, to take that load off of our staff and allow them to continue the fabulous things that they do every day. So that's, that's a major concern of mine with uh, an expanded process in the RFP. Um, I want your engagement. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that the RFP matters as much as the development of the result of the proposal, as the development of the master plans. I think that matters tremendously, and I think that's all about you and all about the, the neighbors and friends and the folks that, that wrote us and, and talked to us. Um, but I think, I think we need to either adopt this process as it sits or adopt a, a brief process to figure out what's missing, because I. I'm not seeing what's missing, folks. I'm just not seeing what's missing. Um, and it looks like maybe you are. So let's, uh, I, I would support a brief process. I went, would not support um, a series of lengthy meetings and conversations to try and get an RFP that's designed to create a series of long meetings and conversations. Mr. I'll, uh, oh, go ahead. I'll jump in briefly, I think, and then we can, and I'd love to continue conversation, so I'll come back to you first, Ms. Farmer. Um, yeah, this is, you know, this is a, we, I've had, a, as, as well, I've had a lot of conversations about this and, and trying to figure out what the next steps might be here. Um, one of the things I would hate to do, and this goes, I think, with what Mr. Jones is, is describing, is to slow anything down. I, I think, you know, and, and when I say that, I mean slow things down to the point of inertia for the sake of inertia. I, I, want, I want to make sure that we get everybody's input and that we move forward we do it together. I think the most important thing, though, is that we have to think about the, who the benefit is for and, and why we are all so passionate about this. It's because we're passionate about what Dubuque can become. We're passionate about what we've seen Dubuque as it is right now. I mean, where things have been. And I can't thank everyone in the room enough for all the work that, that has been done to, um, to get where we are today. I mean, it really is incredible when you think about it. And to, to be um, involved in this in any way uh, is really, for any of us, I think, such an honor to be uh, you know, part of making Dubuque what it is and, and what it can become over the next 50 years. Um, all that said, I guess I would prefer to see this move forward tonight um, 
but with, with a bit of a caveat, and, and I know that this is, this, is, this is different, but I would like to see it move forward with, a, with an understanding that we, we want to see as much engagement with, with people who can be involved in this process as possible. Um, and I guess that's more of a directive to um, you know, city management and staff, if, if we were to choose to do this, obviously, as a council, but um, to, to continue to engage, even though we would be passing this RFP as it stands, to continue to engage um, the folks that have spoken up tonight and, and other folks that have sent us the letter uh, to be able to um, work together as we go through this process. It has to have a point person. You know, I don't think it should have anybody's name on it necessarily because that's not the point. But we need to have somebody that's that's driving the bus, and, and I think that's really important. So, um, Ms. Farber, I'll bring it back to you. Right, and no difference to our bus driver, city council person there. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not talking about me. No, absolutely. The other person. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, what I'm hearing is that this is an issue for timing, and we don't want to necessarily delay the process. But I think what the feedback has been. Um, what I think I am hearing, what I've heard tonight, and what I've heard over the past couple of days is that, indeed, this is uh, not a group that wants to delay progress. It is a group that's ready to rock. They're ready to meet. They're ready to greet the, um, uh, the team and basically come up with um, all the iterations and all of the thoughts and uh, guidance that they can provide for this RFP. My review of this RFP, although I think it's a nice RFP, I'm not sure that it has all the detail in it that um, I have uncovered as I am speaking to people uh, over the last two days. And so um, I like to use one of Dave Resnick's most popular words that is used recently and call it a hybrid. Uh, and maybe this can be amended such that we can have a requirement of during X period of time and maybe it'll be just a couple of weeks uh, for this to um, get together and, and update this uh, RFP to, to meet the needs. And especially because under the guise of Dupaca, who started this in the first place, there's three members on that committee that had requested that they have more input in this document. Um, and I think, and if it does cost more and this group is willing to assist, I think that's, that's another added benefit um, for us as well. So I am for adjusting uh, the current proposal uh, and making it a hybrid. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. Other comments? I have, I have one. Yeah, Ms. Roussel. And then, Mike, I saw your hand. I'll come back to you. Um, I think um, another hybrid option would be to include um, more private and nonprofit stakeholders in the selection process of the RFP. I think Jill had that in one of her memos that, you know, instead of um, more of an internal selection process that we be sure to include um, private and, and the nonprofit sector. So, just to clarify real quick, you're, are you are you are you both kind of saying to include that in um, as an addition to what we're what we're talking about here tonight? Um, is that what you what you'd be saying, Ms. Roussel, since you've um, it, the at the. Jill's uh, memo just stated to, it may be desirable to include some of our private and nonprofit sector stakeholders in the selection process I see. once the proposals are um, received. Okay. And I'm, Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Mr. Mayor. And I am saying that I think we need to step back uh, and take a, a period of time, and I think it would be not a delayed amount of time, not a long period of time, uh, to get um, more conversation and more updates. And I, I'm really concerned that these are the people that are living, working there. They are the ones that are um, really giving the city um, the vibrancy mm -hmm. uh, down there and all the good things that have happened down there. They just want to move it forward. They're very enthusiastic. Things have been growing. We're not, they were not, and especially when Kim David had this conversation, she was just overwhelmed with the fact that they've got over 500 people in and out of her gym mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was concerned that she would like more direct input um, and that that would be, you know, her pleasure uh, and her commitment to her time to do that. Mm -hmm. So, she, you know, these people are concerned. They're wonderfully um, educated about what goes on there. They're very smart business people. They're very entrepreneurial uh, and they're just reaching out. Okay. Thank you and for I the added clarification there, Ms. Farber. I appreciate yep. it. Uh, Mike. Uh, um, briefly, is that? Yeah. So thank you for cons your consideration. But one thing I want to point out is, is that we talk about Mr. Jones. You mentioned the city staff and the, 
that this is, you know, adds to the workload. And this is precisely why we want to be engaged. That's one of the points. We have experts, architects, planners, who've looked at the RFP and said there's opportunity to improve this. And one of the things that Jill told us is, I have a, had a limited amount of time. So let's utilize our experts to come together with the city. And we talked about this with city engineering, city planning a couple of months ago, and we were talking about this. And some of your engin city engineers said, we need somebody to carry, help carry the load. Because if we don't have ownership from the private sector, some of these plans, we don't have time to uh, own them by ourselves. They sit in file cabinets sometimes. So, you know, we have experts, they want to be at the table, and I'm hearing, and I think Brad, you and I have talked about this, there are a lot of people that want to be engaged on city commissions, mm -hmm. historic preservation people, folks at Heritage Works, they don't want to be treated as advisors. And no one's doing this on purpose, but one of the things that Mary and I see as one of the most powerful things that we can do for the rest of our working career is to help create a platform for people to use their voice and to be engaged. You know, just not be a good message to say there's no more input. That's the last thing that we want to do for people that showed up here tonight. Let's put some fuel on their fire. You, you don't have all the answers, we don't have all the answers. And as one of our great leaders from Dubuque, Frank Birch, said, you know, uh, he said, we are all incomplete and we become complete as a team. So let's do that. This doesn't have to take a lot of time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gronin. Thank you. It's a good closer. All right, Mike. So when there is a vote, I'm going to need to understand what the vote is directing. Mm -hmm. And so we've brought together a proposal, which we did vet with the property owners. And specifically, I know I personally had a meeting with the Gronins about it. And we did incorporate uh, language that they asked to have incorporated. But the process that what we've brought to you is an engagement process. So no conclusions. So it, it, this RFP is not going to solve anybody's parking problem. It's the results of the process that would be that would we would be commissioning is where we would get those kinds of answers and inputs mm -hmm. from people about whatever their issues are and their ideas for solving them. So if this is rejected to go back to meet with the property owners again to ask them about the RFP, I need to know, am I developing a request for proposal to have a robust community engagement process about amending the plan, or am I engaging the property owners saying, what do, you, what do you want to happen as a result of the plan? For instance, a property owner that says, I have all these people coming to my business every day and there's nowhere for in the park. So as of today, I would tell that person, well, I'm not gonna solve your parking problem today. What I'm doing is issuing a request for proposal to bring somebody in who will engage you and a whole bunch of other people in a conversation about what are your issues, what are your ideas to solve them, and then come up with opportunities to, to solve them. So I just wanna know if it, does, if it gets rejected to say, go back, am I going back to say, okay, what additional wording do you want in the request for proposals for us to hire somebody to engage the community in a conversation not just the property owners, even though they're an unbelievably important part, they're the investment engine, they're, they should have a loud voice in this, but it would be to engage the community in a conversation about the district, or am I going to meet with the property owners to say, what are the results you want? Well, I want more parking, or I want uh, whatever they want, you know, two-way, one-way, I want a different connection to the to the uh, um, gavel on so the trucks don't come through here. Those are things that would come out of a process like this. So I just need to know which one am I doing? Am I in working just to add language to the request for proposals, 
because maybe people think it's not clear what we're asking them to do, which is engage the community in conversation around the plan, the existing plan and how it could be amended, or am I engaging them in a conversation about the solutions to the problems that they know already exist? Okay. Because we're gonna do whatever you tell us to. Yep, understood. But I need to know what I'm supposed to do. Right. Thank you, Mike, for that clarification. So for the sake of uh, moving the conversation along, uh, Mr. Jones, you made the motion to approve, to receive and file and approve the current request for proposal as it's stated in the uh, documents that we received today. Um, I'd give you the floor. Do you have any changes to make to that motion? I, I don't. Okay. And Mr. Resnick, you seconded. Uh, so that's the motion currently that we are voting on, is to take this as it is today and uh, move forward with it. So um, I guess at this point, do we have any other discussion before I call Durant. that vote? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Moran. So I just, I just want to, um, in response to, to Mike, and, and I certainly understand where he's coming from, and he needs guidance and direction, and, mm -hmm. and thank you for bringing that up once again tonight. Um, I... Using the Kim David example, because I think that's what you were saying, the 500 people and where are they going to park or where are they going to put their bikes kind of statement. Um, she said, I don't really want to talk about that. Her comment was she wants to be part of the creation of the RFP in a more broad sense for more buy-in and more insightful comments. So I think, again, it's potentially a hybrid solution here. Uh, that she was looking for, but contrary to I, this is what I want, A, B, C, D, she was more for the process and for the input because things have been changing. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Sprank. One more question for Mr. Van Nogan. Um So the process would probably, the way I'm reading all this, would be very similar to the creation of the design of Comiskey Park. That would be, that would be a great example. Which had multiple... The neighborhood and... Other people, whoever had any interest in the park, they didn't even have to live by it. They could come and state their opinion. Yeah. That's what I need to know. Thank you. All right, I don't want to him and haw too much here, but I think for my for for my purposes, I mean, I want to I want to be clear about what what I'm going to be voting on. So. I, I get where you're coming from, I really do. And I understand that you want to be engaged in this process and, and not just the people sitting in this room, but a lot of people who have been involved in this. I think it's really important. Um, I, I'm a little bit more on the side of Mr. Jones though, honestly, in that I, I don't necessarily see enough difference to be able to say, let's not move forward with this RFP and that's gonna completely kill the whole idea and the whole, the whole ability for us to, to move forward together um, as a community and, and as stakeholders in this. I think if we move this forward tonight that we can absolutely have a very robust discussion about all the things you wanna have a discussion about. Um, and I think you will be very involved in the process going forward. I, I, think you've, I, I think you've made that very clear that this needs to be a part of, that your involvement needs to be um, big in this. But the other thing that I think is, is really hidden home with me with, uh, with Mike's comments, Mr. Van Milligan's comments here is that um, you know, we, we have an ability to, in, the, in doing this, to, to reach even further and not just have the conversation with the folks that have already had the conversation with us, but to reach out into the community even further. That's a part of what this RFP describes. Um, so honestly, I think I'm, I'm ready to vote for this as it, as it stated, um, and since uh, Mr. Jones would uh, prefer to keep his motion as it stated, then I suggest we take a vote and then we vote on this as it is right now and we'll see if it passes and if it does not, um, then I think it would be um, a conversation that we, I guess, would need to bring back to council to, to have more discussion and more direction for you. Or would you, can we, I need to actually ask this question from a process standpoint. If we vote this down, um, can we then? Someone can make another motion. Someone can make another motion to Correct. be able to, to change this. Okay, Correct. thank you very much, Krenna. Okay, so then I'm actually gonna ask Adrian to call the roll and um, we have a motion on the, for Mr. Jones, second by Resnick, to receive and file and approve as it stands. Farber? No. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? No. Jones? Aye. Roussel? No. Kavanaugh? Aye. So it's a tie vote, 3-3, three, three. motion fails. And entertain another motion? Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion that we amend um, that the RFP process, and I'm not sure what the language is this, for this, but I'd like to see it amended such that we can include 
uh, the input of the stakeholders uh, in the process. So I'm not sure how that language should should so, be. Uh, traditionally, Mike, I don't know if you're comfortable with it, but it, it would be receive and file, refer to city manager with direction. That, that, that'd be fine. I guess I'm going to, if you go ahead and make that motion, I'd like to make a comment on the motion so I know, know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> know what the direction is, I'm guessing, is the question, yes. Right. You have to fill in the blank there. Right. So, so I guess in, in suggesting what the, as you, as you think about the motion, um, we have a request from the city manager to make sure that we have some sort of direction, specific direction, um, as you think about what that motion might be. Okay, so it's receive and file and provide direction? Or re refer to the city manager providing the direction okay. with it. Okay, can I just, she said it for me? <laughs> <laughs> Probably needs to come from you. <laughs> so it's receive and file and, and um, have the city manager provide direction? No, you would, you would provide him the direction. So that's what I, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so receive and file and provide the direction for the city manager to proceed. Okay. Okay, I'll second that. All right, we have a motion by Ms. Farber, second by Ms. Roussel. Um, so I'll just open directly for discussion. Um, Mike, you've, you specifically requested, what is the direction then? If it's not gonna be what the RFP was, what is the direction? Is that fairly stated? Yes. And you'd like some specifics on what that direction is? Okay. Yes. Okay. I don't wanna mess up. I mean, I wanna do whatever you want us to do. <laughs> yes. Understood. And I'm not clear right now, so okay. I want yep. to become clear. Fair enough. Okay. All right. Mr. So some Mayor. clarity, please. Yes, Mr. Resnick. Uh, first of all, I just think we just have this great group of, of concerned citizens here who are just saying we can do better. Now, that, there's some exciting possibilities. And, you know, so I think we need to, you know, envision this input and, 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 and give some clear directions. It can't be, it has to be more specific for Mr. Van Milligan. So I think it's worth a... Uh, discussing how we can do that uh, because it will move forward. Uh, I think uh, this uh, Millwork District sta stakeholders sh should have some input. Now, how do we do it? Now, I don't think we should shirk from trying some things, and it might be a little messy, but because well, the exciting possibilities are, are too good to let go. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us. So that doesn't help with specifics. So I would love to, I would love to hear some suggestions about a meeting. Uh, and uh, not everything that the stakeholders uh, will is possible to put in there necessarily. But I think it, they have some ideas that can measurably improve the RFP. So how do we do it, uh, Mr. Mayor? And um, that's all I have right now, but I'd like to uh, chime in if someone has uh, uh, some specifics. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Roussel, let's uh, Sorry, see. Okay. Um, I think we should think about a, a specific time frame that, you know, the, our stakeholders need to meet within, you know, two months or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and then I'd, I'd also like to... Um, Add that the the recommended review committee include some of the um, representatives of the the business community, the nonprofit. Just add a couple people to that review committee as well. Okay. Uh, Ms. Farber. That was my comments. That's okay. Right. So I hear time frame, and I hear um, maybe I can. Oh, Mr. Sprank. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We're going to involve the stakeholders this much. All right. I want a very clear list of what you want. No f warm, fuzzy things. Just 10 things that say these are what you need or want. Because I get what they're wanting, I, but I'd want to see a very clear list that makes sense of what their needs and actions are. Because this is now we're asking our city manager to been possibly up to two weeks, months. I don't know how much time we're giving them, but we need to have a very clear goal into these meetings that just says this is it. That's what I would like to see. So okay. thank you. Um, it, Mr. Jones, you comment? Well, I, I guess I would suggest that, uh, that proposals be de developed and delivered in writing by some date mm -hmm. and then a, a, something, a group be convened to, to go through those and, and they'll either be added to the RFP, removed from the RFP, whatever it is. Um, Danny's right, it has to, be, has to be concise. This is what we're talking about. Um, I, 
and maybe you would take this RFP as the model and say, we like this, but we, we think you could do better here, we think you could do better here, we think, you, and I think with a fairly short process, um, you might get a document that you like better, um, but, but the goal's in the engagement, and the engagement's down the road once we've got the, got the person. We have to we have to start and end with that thought. Is that that's where the gold is? Um, so this this is how we mine it, I guess. Okay. Let me take a crack at bringing this all together and see if we can and wrap up this conversation if possible. Um, I hear that um, I hear a time frame. So let's. Uh, I would suggest within um, is one month realistic? Too much or or good? Okay. So here's my suggestion. Um, have the city manager and staff convene the group of stakeholders listed in the letter that we have received, because there are multiple people who signed this letter that we have received um, from the stakeholders in the Millwork District. So have the city manager and staff convene a group of stakeholders listed in the letter we received this week within one month. And then from there, that will be the direction that is provided. So convene that group and come up with direction from there. Is that? Mm -hmm. Acceptable for everybody here, um, Mike. Is that something that? Yes. So, so I certainly understand that step. Um, I want to better understand, though, what we're trying to achieve in that meeting. Are we trying to achieve what should we add to this request for proposals, mm -hmm. which is soliciting a consultant to do the community engagement process, or are we soliciting? solutions to currently identified issues that other people may have ideas about what their solutions are. Uh, my suggestion would be to form the RFP, not the solutions. Okay. To, to, yeah. to further format an RFP for, to, to send out. Yes, agree. I see agreements from Ms. Roussel, Ms. Farber. Define the, define the engagement a little better. Uh, can, can you elaborate, please, Mr. Jones? I, I can't, um, but, but that's, if there's a weak link, that's, that's probably it. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what's to change? You, you're, you're looking to hire a consultant to contract to, to manage community engagement to help you produce a document. That's, that's the, the long and the short of it. So we can't really add words to we're going to hire a contractor. We can't really hire, add words to this. So the only place to add words is in the what does the community engagement look like mm -hmm. um, that you that you seek? Uh, but I, I I think we go back to give us precise proposals, which which may or may not end up in that RFP. In all honesty, mm -hmm. um, that uh, can be brought to city staff for consideration and recommended in recommendation to this body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to create concise proposals um, for for the RFP itself, basically, is it like to mm -hmm. proposals for what needs to go into this RFP, because that's right. the request here. And, and I completely agree that the RFP is not about parking. Mm -hmm. It's not about air traffic. It's not about anything else. It's about community engagement mm -hmm. and developing a plan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, um, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, I think um, the other thing to do is to include the group of stakeholders in the entire process, as I think uh, Laura had mentioned. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that they're part of the um, selection, the selection, but also in the, the final document to, to give feedback on that final document mm -hmm. and whatever hybrid it takes, shape it takes now, and then to be involved in um, the process of the selection of uh, the consultant, and then also as an ongoing basis by just definition, they would mm -hmm. be part of the engagement process on a more detailed level as the um, project moves forward. I think that's what I heard. Okay. Um, Mike, the city manager, how are you? Is, do you have the direction you need at this it's point? It's a lot clearer. Okay. Um, and I <laughs> offer this not as a caution, but just as a fact that when I bring it back to you, we might be talking more a budget bigger than $50,000. I'm not making that an issue. I just want to point it out in case I come back with that, that mm -hmm. there, there won't be any surprise. Yep. Right. Okay. And, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Ms. Farmer. <laughs> and that was part of the conversation that was brought up to me as well, mm -hmm. is that this group would be um, uh, hopefully you know, open to assisting with that budget, mm -hmm. knowing that it might be increased in its, in its uh, purpose. 
Are you comfortable with what you have from us at this point? I okay. think so, and I, I, I think Jill's listening, so I hope, yeah. she's <laughs> hope she's comfortable too. So. so in that case, before we take a vote, I just want to point something out. This process gets super clunky when we do it this way. There's a reason that we have a city manager form of government with a council overseeing that from a policy standpoint. And it's so we don't um, run into situations like this too often, where we, we start burning the midnight oil to try and, um, what I would say, public wordsmith the things that come in front of us. I think it's really important that all of us recognize that so that in the future, we can try to avoid situations like this and work more efficiently on the front end so that on the back end, we can, it can come before us. We can see something that has been worked on by the folks that it's their daily job to do this, boots on the ground, making these differences um, and making this stuff happen that comes before us that is ready to go and, and packaged in a way that, that we can then say, yes, we want this or we don't. Um, I would really like to try to avoid a process like this in the future if we can. I appreciate the fact that we've had so much conversation on it tonight. I really do. I appreciate the fact that we've had so much public input on it. Um, but I hope we recognize um, the clunkiness of how this works when we do it this way. Um, so thank you again. I, I, don't, I don't mean to, over, uh, to, to state that I, 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 I don't mean any disrespect in the conversation that we've had. I just mean that there's a reason that we do things the way we do it in the form of government that we have. Yeah, Mike. If you don't mind, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor. I, I, since I uh, work with the city staff and they work for me, it would not be fair of me to not mention the fact that Jill Connors is our economic development director routinely meets with the property owners. And a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they have a standing uh, meeting appointment. Mm -hmm. And um, that this item in particular was scheduled to be on the December uh, city council agenda and uh, the agenda packets go uh, to the public on a Friday morning. I sent them myself to the stakeholders on Monday just to tell them, I want you to know this is going out and received feedback that, well, wait a minute, we don't feel like we had enough input yet. So I directed Jill, I said, okay, Jill, we're gonna take it off the agenda and go back to the group to make sure that they've had an opportunity to have input. She did have another stakeholder meeting and asked for input. And I think she only received one comment. And then um, I have a standing meeting with the Gronins and their, their uh, team. Um, and after that meeting, which was in, I think late December, it was after what I just described anyway, um, they, uh, there was a discussion about the RFP, so I stayed on with Jill on the uh, call to hear and participate in the discussion about the RFP. And as I said, they then submitted some written comments which we incorporated into the RFP. And I'm not saying any of that to be in any way critical of what happened tonight. We're, this is the way it works. <laughs> you tell us what to do and we do it. So we're okay with that. But it wouldn't be fair of me to Jill and all the effort she did put in to get input of the stakeholders and all the input she puts in all year to meet with them, to talk to them about all kinds of different issues, to just let it go on. Because somebody who doesn't know all that information, who might be watching tonight or listening in, or in the future, would be wondering, gee, I wonder why the city didn't talk to any of these people before they showed up at the city council meeting with this thing. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of conversation and a lot of input. We're 100% okay with there's gonna be more of that, but it's important you know that there already was that. Thank you for pointing that out. I think it's an incredibly important point that there's been a lot of um, very professional work done already on the front end of this, and, and that's something that we definitely need to recognize. So thank you very much to Jill Connors as the Economic Development Director. I wanna make sure I say that publicly too. All right, we have a motion um, by Ms. Farber and a second by Ms. Roussel with direction offered to the city manager. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Action item number five is City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 11, Rights of Way, Chapter 3, Cable Television. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Um, First, a question of process. Uh, can we 
do the motion to waive readings for both ordinances at once? Yes. Which we soon file the communications and further move that the requirement that these proposed ordinances be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting in which they are finally to be passed be suspended. Second. A motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Senior Council Barry Lindahl recommends City Council adoption of ordinances repealing Title 11, Chapter 3, Articles A, D, and E, and adopting a new Article A, providing for a franchise fee for cable and video services. Iowa Code Chapter 477A requires the city to request that the incumbent cable provider and any competitive cable provider to pay a franchise fee. The proposed ordinance affirms the current Mediacom fee and provides that all cable and video service providers must pay the franchise fee required by Chapter 477A. The ordinance will avoid any issues over the timing of any request and also provides enforceability for the fee requirement. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Do we have any discussion? Okay. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? We will final consideration and passage of both the ordinances. Second. A motion by Mr. Jones, second by Mr. Resnick. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Action item number six is video of B Branch Creek Railroad Culverts ribbon cutting on October 21st, 2021. Mr. Mayor? <laughs> yes, Mr. Resnick. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I, I didn't hear Mr. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I Thank you. I, I move to receive and file and view the video. I'll second. All right, thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Resnick, uh, second by Ms. Roussel. I believe it's Felicia back there. Go ahead and roll that video for us. <laughs> the most critical flood control features, the new culverts and related structures and equipment are fully functional and that is the milestone that we're celebrating today. <clears throat> Absolutely. The area is now protected for up to a 500 year rain event. When we started the first few phases of our uh, B Branch flood mitigation project, the B Branch system could handle the five year rainstorm before flooding could be expected. I can remember back in 1999, we had a six inch rainfall and I was standing in three feet of water in my basement. There's large box culverts that uh, pass the, the upper B Branch Creek under Garfield Avenue uh, into a buried concrete structure that then funnels the water into six eight foot diameter tunneled culverts. Uh, into the lower B branch here and onto the Mississippi River. A couple of things that are more notable that you might have noticed walking up here is the, the large gray gate and the, with the uh, cylinder and hydraulic arms uh, attached to them. Th that along with the small building behind me and some small pumps below me, that's a system to help us to be able to manage the, the water elevation in the upper B branch uh, and also in the upstream storm sewers. It's amazing to see what Dubuque has accomplished. The goal of the Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. With the city's work on B Branch, we see a shining and clear example of where vision, planning, and hard work has made real, demonstrable steps toward achieving this goal. Dubuque is a model of how environmental protection, flood mitigation, and civic pride can come together to create solutions that are practical, innovative, and a real asset to the community. The work that you have seen done here by the city is not only a shining beacon for the city, it's a shining beacon for the state that can be replicated across our state, but also across the country. So I want to say thank you not only for the vision that the team had here in Dubuque of how this could work, but also thank you for being able to allow this for other people to look at it, to kind of be that, hey, this can really happen. You're an inspiration for other cities in the state, also an inspiration for other people and cities inside of this country. 
Dubuque is a city of innovators. Uh, they're on the cutting edge. They serve as a model for water quality improvement initiatives. They set the example for what a community can do um, and what it can be done within city limits or even upstream in the watershed to protect our rivers and our streams. I couldn't be happier with the progress that our dedicated city staff has made over this nearly decade long project. I, like many neighbors, have watched and waited for this day to come. The vision has taken form, and yet this great work still continues. There's been approximately $600 million has been distributed throughout Iowa for flood mitigation in the state since uh, 2014. And it's amazing what's been done. And the, uh, the, uh, the nice things that have happened as a result of the $600 million. In December of 2015, the city of Dubuque purchased the Bloom Company property as part of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. In order to maintain the mile-long B Branch Creek Greenway and ensure its functions as designed, a maintenance facility is planned at the 16th and Elm Street location where the Bloom Company served for two generations. In 2020, Al and Suzanne donated $400,000 the America's River 3 campaign in support of the B Branch Watershed Project. This is a magnificent award and statue that we know will find a prominent place uh, in your home. So congratulations to you, and here you go. Well, I didn't expect anything like this to happen right here today. Uh, I know they originally, originally started, I just wanted to have something left in my father's memory, and we certainly have it now. I'm just overwhelmed. I don't know what any more I can say. That's right. I'm going to activate the gate structure that Darren mentioned, and it will slowly lower to its down position. We're going to hit the button. It was a fun day. It was almost warm <laughs> considering what we got today. So, all right, the uh, motion was to receive and file, watch the video. So, uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Next are council member reports. All right, any council member reports? Yeah, Mr. Sprank. Yeah, I, I want to thank uh, Marie Ware for coming to my neighborhood association, the North End Neighborhood Association, and she gave generously of her time discussing all the issues that have partaken getting Comiskey Park literally off the ground or out of the ground, um, and just the complexities of funding, as well as there was a delay because of an archaeological study. So just thank her tremendously for all the time that she gave my neighbors because it was she was there for a good hour and a half just explaining hmm. the complexity of the issue of, of just trying to build a park. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spink. Any other council member reports? Yeah, uh, Mr. Jones. Three of us here uh, spent a good chunk of last Monday night with the uh, Iowa Special Olympics athletes. I think Laura spent some time with them as well. Um, so glad to have them back in Dubuque and having fun. I, it was the mayor's first uh, official um, mayoral thing to do to go down and, and welcome the group. And I suspect it will have been his favorite thing for some time to come. <laughs> That's absolutely we had a good true. Night. Absolutely true. I'm not sure we can top that for a while. So, Mr. Resnick. Yes, uh, Mr. Jones beat me to the punch. Oh, but sorry. I no, because what I actually wanted to um, really focus on is in the Iowa Special Olympics uh, is the volunteers that make such an important difference. And I just want to highlight my colleague and friend, Rick Jones, who probably 30 years of, of dragging all that heavy equipment down there and setting up and uh, playing for uh, everybody and then a big old 
you know, break down and, and, and drag it all out again. But always, um, you know, it, now that he's won this election, it's not political anymore. I can, I can heap praise on him. <laughs> so, and, and why wait? Why are we waiting to, to praise the people who do great work in this city? And Rick Jones and the Iowa Special Olympics is an incredible instance of, of somebody absolutely giving uh, from the heart and uh, nonstop giving. So I just wanted to do that. Sorry to put you on the spot, Rick Jones. But the citizens uh, should know what a gem they have and uh, somebody who really has dedicated his life to all the citizens of Dubuque. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that, Mr. Resnick. All right, we do have a closed session, so I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move the council going to closed session to discuss pending litigation, purchase or sale of real estate in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Resnick. For the record, the attorneys the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in the closed session are City Attorney Crenna Brumwell and Attorney Les Reddick. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Barber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. We are in closed session.